Quest an. Yeah, it's in, it's on. Um, good morning for uh, the ones that actually are able to join us in flesh uh, here. Um, we are located at Radio Kotwijk. We are, as indicated in the new regulations, 30 people inside the space, including all the crew and technicians. And we are about to embark on two presentations of the new 2020-21 um, COPE study groups. Um, we are happy to welcome um, today a um, member of the tutorial team of our partner, Casco Art Institute, working for the Commons. Uh, long-lasting relationship uh, with Casco, as well as If I Can Dance. As far as I can remember, officially our partnership was initiated, ignited in 2007, and it has been going through since then, through various, um, let's say, modes of, of participation, exchange, various formats of uh, finding their place through publishing classes, um, through uh, COPE, of course, constellations that have been running in that format for the last years, um, invitations, um, um, and, and so forth. Uh, maybe uh, there is a partnership um, um, section on our website. So for the ones that are joining us on live stream, uh, I welcome them as well, especially first and second year students, which will predominantly be at checking, most likely, uh, those presentations this morning. Um, there is, as I said, um, a link on our website that briefly describes also the history, what Casco Art Institute Working for the Commons is, how they actually updated or transformed or mutated through the years to exist as a space working for the commons. Within that framework, they are this year ready to uh, present um, a study line that relates um, to, let's say, a constellation of thinkers, activists, workers, artists, uh, which come by the name um, GCC, so Climate Justice Code team, I working should say. Group. Working group. Working group. Um, we are happy to welcome today to present, uh, and I will read the title of the COPE, Reframing Climate Colonialism, Pleasuring the Radical Imagination. We are happy to welcome Clementine Edwards, uh, a member of the Dia alumni community, and returning to us as Leon as well for Bulegua, as we introduced as now with a new hat, with a new, let's say, tutorial position. As a member of the tutorial team, we have her here in flesh, and we're really happy about it. Welcome. And we will be joining virtually, in a sense, uh, by Ama Josephine Budge, which is uh, the second member of the tutorial team. Uh, I will not say more about her. I think what has been prepared will trigger you, uh, charm you, and welcome you to think of possible participation uh, for the COPE Summit, for the COPE study group. Uh, I leave the floor to you. Thank you. Thanks again. And looking forward to hearing <laughs> your unpacking of reframing climate colonialism, pleasuring the radical imagination. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Nikos. Thank you, and hi to everyone here. <laughs> um, it's a peculiar situation to be talking to so few people 
but um, it's nice to see friendly faces here and lots of first years and second years that I already know and I'm excited to get to know a little bit more, um, possibly. <laughs> um, so as Nikos introduced, our, um, our I speak appearing physically alone, but I actually have <laughs> lots of people around me and who you'll encounter some of today. Um, but our title, the title of the working group is Reframing Climate Colonialism, Pleasuring the Radical Imagination. Um, <laughs> based on a recent bus conversation about five minutes ago, um, I'm going to start with an um, astrological reference from Cheney Nicholas, who perhaps a number of you know. She's the, um, a true guru and a wonderful writer. Um, I read her, this was her update on the new moon a couple of weeks ago, but it feels kind of relevant to right now. When Mars, planet of action, desire, and an aggression is retrograde, it asks us to review the ways in which we are using our energy. Being busy, isn't the business if all we are doing is tiring ourselves out. As the world's issues become increasingly complex and urgently in need of our care, becoming ever more specific about what we do and why, and applying our time and talent to solutions with an impact rather than just strategies to get ahead personally is mandatory. I was also going to read you my Sagittarius one specifically, but I thought that might be a little bit much. Um, so, mm -mm -mm. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to introduce a few different elements today. I'm here representing the Climate Justice Code Working Group with um, Ama Josephine Budge, who you'll recognize or meet shortly on video. Um, and there are a couple of other people who you'll also meet. Um, but I wanted to start by reading a text I've written for the code, which is a written document, um, on art and the radical imagination. I'm here as a tutor representing, I, I'm not claiming to be a climate activist or a climate justice um, activist, expert, anything like that. Um, I'm accessing and thinking through climate justice from the framework of art and um, Ama has a little bit more expertise in climate uh, justice work and climate colonialism, um, but my entry point is art, and so I'm going to um, invite you all into the subject using it with a text that I wrote recently for the Climate Justice Code. I'm going to have a sip of water. Okay. I've been dreaming through the last few weeks, thinking, reading, looking, talking, and in the days, as of the days have slanted into autumn, I've changed. Tussling with the ego logic of the I, the I, that menace, and the deep places of possibility where change and social life and making things live, I've understood myself to be tussling with the idea with tussling with an idea I have about beauty and delight, which I'd like to describe to you now. I call this idea the clearing. It is a dream site enclosed by forest or bushland, or it is when morning sun burns away the fog, sort of like something I saw out my window this morning. Here, simple, beautiful things evade capture or words. And while the clearing may be surrounded by thickets of things I don't want to talk about, heroes, history, pure form, property, it is an open sight nonetheless. No individual experience is beyond context. Although there may be frameworks in life that dictate the ways in which you or I are understood, and these frameworks might explain the conditions of one's pain, Living is and must be a situation to be experienced and interacted with, rather than a problem to be solved with frameworks or otherwise. 
Art started for me as a shelter within which beauty is a radical act of subsistence. Touching and making is affirmation of presence in the here, now, and repetitive action is gentle reminder of being in one's skin. What such actions produce a charged, a transfiguration of the given. Here I am at the studio desk, closely focused on rearranging the delicate body of a fly. Such actions envision otherwise, tell story otherwise. I sweep the floor and produce with the broom a beautiful pile of dust, and the soft grey mountains contain worlds. Pay attention. Minutes, days, or weeks have passed, and I've noticed something in my chest. Leaden and flaky, anxiety has settled in. Despite the pretty thought, my thinking on this clearing doesn't feel right. If emotions tell me something about the present, then affect and feeling is something that I'm always catching up to. Anxiety in my chest told me that my views were changing. Slow-tongued, I felt, saw, intuited that I was approaching these deep places of possibility from my thinking of yesterday. I run through the thicket, chasing my feelings for guidance. Art is not only shelter. Yes, it can look inward and reflect, getting to the feeling underneath the thing. From this hideout, it can respond and critique structures within which we are framed, for they are inescapable. And it can conjure a dream site enclosed by forest or bush. But the presence of the thicket casts long shadows around me and I haven't been paying attention to the tracks that have been laid down by those before me. To get engage with art is to say, yes, hello, here I am, and here is this story. The greeting need not be loud, and the story need not be a big one. But to pay attention and invite conversation with others who are paying attention and able, with the resources to pay attention, is to be alive to texture and difference. So what does one do with that difference? Does one describe or critique or envision something otherwise? To reflect on this is one part of the work of art practice. And the other part, practicing art is an act of world building and it is itself a possible framework for living. Audre Lorde wrote that poetry is a skeleton architecture of our lives, and she might have been speaking about art more broadly. Art as a skeleton architecture of our lives. So how might this architecture work in relation to other more painful structures that shape our lives? If art is to hint at possibility made real, then it is also to understand that artistic resources are political. Access is political, geography is political, heritage is political. And image making and representation individually and institutionally and everything in between is political. Art can be walking lightly with the earth. How close can we get to affect's wisdom? Art and this subject, as you'll see, is making one's political claims in the present because to recognize this is to understand that the, in the ongoing now, in, in the unfolding now, in ongoingness, we are figuring out life. It is here that we are radically recalibrating, speculatively dreaming and instituting otherwise. The subject reframing climate colonialism, pleasuring the radical imagination, pleasurably and critically interrogates some of the following questions. What is climate colonialism and how does it apply in a range of geopolitical spaces? How might we map our own situated artistic practices and selves within ongoing processes of climate colonialism? How can we pressure, lobby and transform the current cultural landscape to acknowledge climate colonialism and respond in climate just ways. How can we take this work on in modes that engage pleasure activism, delight, 
well-being, sustainability, well-being and sustainability personally amongst the study group, um, both of the CJC's human counterparts, those involved in the study group and our alter human kin. And what does radical imagination have to do with it? So drawing on the collective intelligence of the study group participants, the group will begin its work by looking at how to hold together, identify and advocate for different spatio-temporal experiences as interconnected by European institutions. And um, I wanted to say at the beginning of this talk that um, when I first arrived at the Dai, I've mentioned earlier that I really struggled with lots of art speak and lots of the language and I was going to invite you to read along with a subject description on the website. I'm not positive that it's online just yet, but um, perhaps you can read along in the future. <laughs> you can remember me here saying if there's anything you want to return to, there's um, lots of information there on the subject description. So I encourage you, if you're just asking uh, what the fuck are these words, just check it out. Um, it's probably, hopefully, a little bit more um, clear. Uh, so, oh yeah, when I was, I was speaking about um, us, uh, the study group, kind of looking at how to hold together, hold together and identify and advocate for our different experiences um, interconnected by the European institutions that we associate with. So for instance, CASCO, the study group leader, or for instance, Dutch Art Institute might be a starting point for relation if we don't otherwise have a relation to European arts institutions. And I say this because European arts institutions are, of course, being made in the image of, or are even co-authors of the production of the image of European empires and their values of accumulation, linearity, rationality, etc. So uh, for this study group, we invite you, our co-conspirators, to interrogate and bring into the group your understandings of, for instance, uh, the colonial relationship between the country or countries that shape you and Western Europe, uh, where we will be situated during the year. So some questions that might come up to think through this idea is, um, uh, what are the artistic elements of that relationship, for instance? Um, are there indigenous, stolen or sacred objects still housed in arts institutions in your country or from your country? Um, who funds these arts institutions? Uh, how can articulating these connections as individuals and as collectives within the system in turn advocate for and create actual change? So that's a lot. Um, I encourage you to go back to the website, check it out. Um, with all of these questions in mind, I uh, wanted to give you a bit of context around the Climate Justice Code Working Group, the Climate Justice Code, and uh, myself and Amma. So, Casco Art Institute, the associating uh, the associated institution, this year um, introduces the Climate Justice Code to the Dai. So Amma, Josephine, Budge and I are leading the group, as I said, as representatives of, um, of the working group, the Climate Justice Code Working Group, uh, who I will describe uh, shortly, um, and also kind of joining you as our future students. I wanted to share with you an introduction from Amma. Hello, I'm Amma Josephine Budge. My pronouns are she, her. And I'm really sorry that I couldn't be with you there today um, and this week, but I, I know you're in very, very good hands with Clem there. And looking forward to meeting you a bit later in the year and hopefully working quite clo closely with those of you who choose to work within our study group. So reframing climate colonialism, pleasuring the radical imagination, as you know, because you would have, uh, you would have, um, read the briefing that we've submitted, is really looking quite closely at what climate colonialism means now within the arts. So how is it made visual within arts institutions, within arts policy and cultural practices, but also how is it made visual in the relationships between an institution and a curator, a curator and an artist? How are those artists made safe or not made safe when welcomed into a space? And what are the historical and contemporary 
climate justice relationships of that arts institution. So what do they hold in their collection? Who's funding them? And how do you work with arts institutions? Because inevitably, those of us who are living or working within Europe, within Western Europe in particular, need to work with these arts institutions. So how can you work with them critically? How can you engage? How can you challenge and support them to transform? And that's really what the Climate Justice Code is all about. So we centre reparations, repatriation and repair, care, care, sorry, and pleasure activism. And that means that we're interested not in quick fixes, not in quick policy changes, but we're really interested in holistic change, institutional change, structural change, and sustainable change. And that means that it also has to be something that doesn't burn out the activists and organizers who are lobbying for that change, or the curators and programmers and producers and admin and HR teams and comms teams that are also working within the institution to try and transform that, that structural organization. So that's why we're really thinking quite quite dedicatedly with pleasure, pleasure activism, care, self-care, collective care models and, and using them to think through how this can be how this can be sustainable change. So I uh, am a science fiction writer, first and foremost, I write speculative fiction. I'm also a climate colonialism and pleasure activist researcher. I'm doing my PhD at Birkbeck in London at the moment. I am uh, gosh, I do quite a lot of things. I facilitate a lot, I run events, I run conferences, I am a training masseuse, um, but I'm really thinking kind of holistically across academia and the arts and all the spaces in between, um, what it means to survive thinking with climate justice today, particularly as a, as a woman of colour, particularly as people of colour and, and queer, trans and non-binary people, how we do this work, which can be really destructive uh, for one's mental health and one's social structures. So how do we do this work together safely, as safe, safely as possible, or thinking through what safety looks like, what it means, how one can choose when one's body is unsafe, as opposed to being consistently put unsafe, uh, being consistently made unsafe by others. Um, so we'll kind of be really unpacking all those things and then working very specifically with the Climate Justice Code, which is something that a, a bunch of us have been developing over the past year and longer, um, to be a really active tool almost for the code to itself be an ally that we can work with. And, um, and I've been, yeah, I've been kind of part of the central team thinking with the Climate Justice Code for the past year. So I'm really excited to get into that with some of you and um, to workshop it and develop it and change it and pull it apart and talk about what's missing and what needs to be there. And then also to gift it as much as possible to, to each of you to be a tool for your own navigation of the cultural sector in this madly climate changing world that we are living with and evolving with or have the opportunity to evolve with. So I wanted to just read you some of the questions from one of the essays that I've written for the code that we are asking arts institutions directly to interrogate. So we say that we want arts institutions to interrogate who you're working with, who you're funded by, who you're hiring, which white board members, governors, directors and curators are stepping down to make space for BPOC, that's Black, Indigenous and People of Colour, hires in empowered positions? What anti-racist policies are you putting in place and do they apply to everyone at every level of your organisation? How are you protecting the BPOC artists you invite into your spaces? How are you valuing their emotional and physical labour? How are you quantifying racism and reparations? How are you implementing fundamental change in response to their critical artworks? What are your commitments to care, well-being and mental health? How are you actively working against the co-optation of artists and artworks to diversify your institution, taking the discourse but losing the practice, not actually wanting to do the work and interrogation? How are you repatriating stolen objects and artworks? What are movements you are in co what movements are you in coalition with? And how are you working from what they need, want, or know, not co-opting their resources and turning years of their labour and work into an aesthetic that makes you look good? This is the literal wording of the code. How are you becoming a carbon neutral institution? What are your commitments to tracing the resources used in the artworks you exhibit and by the artists you work with? So being in our study group and working with me, because I won't be there every single month, but the month that I'm there, 
will mean drawing our expertise and resources from across disciplines. It will mean looking at everything from um, cinema to graphic novels to exhibitions to manifestos to newsreels and articles and essays and really kind of building a collage of resources and networks to which we all hopefully at some point will contribute. Um, uh, yes, and that just kind of having a really open and non-hierarchical dialogue um, I think is really important and I'm excited for what the die can bring to the code and what the code can bring to the die and what we can all bring to one another. So really looking forward to meeting you in a couple of months and take care and enjoy this week. That's the most delightful Emma. Emma, she'll be, uh, yeah, we'll be together at our next meeting, wherever that may be. I mean, France, um, so-called France. <laughs> uh, yeah. With Emma's introduction, I wanted to introduce the Climate Justice Code working groups, just so you can understand a little bit about the formation. Um, I'm going to look at Mariana, who is in the audience, because she is the one person who is physically present today who is on the Climate Justice Code uh, for people who are here. Um, she's secretly waving. Um, so Mariana is one of these people. Um, and I just want to list a couple of the other people. Uh, there's Amy Pakal, Bina Choi, who you will meet during um, the year. She's the director of CASCO and will um, be one of the many very exciting guests we're going to have. Uh, I just remembered Mariana Taku. I said Takal, I'm so sorry. It's the, it's the Greek OU. Um, Zoe Scolio, Yinka, Valentina Vela, Yolanda van der Heide, who a number of you already know, uh, Suzanne Dalawal, Karina Jansen, Nicole Jesse, and many others. Um, including Catherine McBride, and I'm going to introduce her now because she will be another guest um, bringing uh, her expertise in deep listening and care uh, practices to uh, the study group uh, in 2021. Um, she's, she, she brings a, a, a different energy. I'm excited for you to meet her online. Um, I'm an artist and part of the working group that's been working on the Climate Justice Code for the past year or so. Um, how I understand it is it's a, it's a process of thinking and working and acting together and learning together about ways to work towards change, um, towards climate justice, which, for, which means in this context here, working a lot on trying to decolonize the structures of the art world um, at an individual level and at a structural level. Um, it's, uh, but what it also is, is a wonderful way of, I think, yeah, what's really important about it is it's not like an instruction of like that this is work that needs to be done and you have to do it, is that it's it's a collective process of um, doing that in a in conversation and community with other people, and that feels really important. Um, and in itself, feels like yeah, a necessary part of of um, embodying the politics that it's claiming. I forgot to introduce this image, uh, which is an image by Alberta Whittle, who will uh, join the code early on, and we'll be learning more about her text and uh, her work, and literally reframing it into the conversation around climate, climate justice work in the arts communities, in the arts, the arts sector. 
Um, so Catherine just now was responding to the question, what is the Climate Justice Code, the CJC? And that's meant to be a little kind of intro to my description, which is going to um, maybe reference some things that you know, maybe not, let's see. Um, uh, I don't know if I want to read this. Um, I'm just going to talk. I anxiously wrote text and now I'm just bored of it. Um, the Climate Justice Code... <laughs> <laughs> was initiated by CASCO last year um, in October 2019. So, uh, and CASCO has an annual assembly, and this was their second annual assembly, and it was um, coming together under this, uh, the title, Our House is on Fire, uh, which you probably know the, um, the, ex the quote, which came from, I'm going to try to say it with a Swedish accent, Greta Thunberg. Um, she, the young, uh, white climate activist who got a whole lot of attention um, and did a lot of excellent work. Um, anyway, so the Climate Justice Code is a written document that was co-drafted by a collective in the lead up to the assembly by um, Dutch-based institutions and collectives and uh, activist groups, including, of course, CASCO, uh, Code Rod, Code Rod, um, fossil Free Culture, NL, Platform Becker, and the Commons Network. Um, and then this draft text was taken to the Assembly, which was attended in pre-COVID days by a hundred plus people. Um, and we, I say we because I was there in attendance, um, collectively workshopped this kind of proposition, this text, over the course of two days. Um, and the code at this point was guided by the question, what practical measures will art and arts institutions take to care for our planetary commons with the power of imagination? So, since then the code has become, um, has, has sharpened and become more of a, um, well, I'm going to read this bit because I think this is important. It was because it was following the experience and the expertise of the, I'm going to say CJC, which stands for Climate Justice Code, of the CJC's uh, black, indigenous and people of colour participants. And I say that specifically because it really was uh, the BIPOC participants who kind of like uh, brought, folk brought the attention to this question of climate colonialism as opposed to this kind of broader uh, and maybe depoliticised and... Uh, <laughs> White supremacist, white supremacist understanding of like individual responsibility, etc. It's actually, um, it, it connects to colonialism. Uh, so uh, based on the experience and expertise of the CJC's BIPOC participants, the code has evolved to centre the climate crisis's uh, inextricable connection to colonialism. And as such, as Amma described, its core principles are reparations, repatriation and repair, which is very important. Um, as well as care, commons, community, and art and radical imagination, which is the text that you heard uh, at the beginning that was um, something that I contributed to. So the code also, as this written document, includes a preamble, a manual of use, and an essay on framing, which is the section that Amma read those questions from just now. Um, and I should say the RRR, reparations, repatriation, repair, section of the code was written also by BIPOC uh, artists, facilitators, etc. So, um, and we've been working in smaller working groups across this past year. Um, the code is itself an acknowledgement that climate change is a direct result of European colonisation, occupation and extraction from, as well as theft of, the human and non-human life and resources from the global south. So, why? Why the code? Um, the CJC was created to critically transform arts institutions and to support arts practitioners in the Netherlands, the West, in Western Europe and also beyond. So it's going to work or it, it works, it, it's, it's going to serve many purposes depending on who is working with the code and who engages and who comes into the study group. Um, but we, we, the idea is that it works as a tool through which we might understand residual and ongoing colonial extractions and repercussions with a particular focus on the environments within which we coexist and their foundational structures. 
um, but it does for the time being, and this of course is going to change uh, as it's taken up by different practitioners and institutions and uh, die um, people who choose to uh, be in the study group. Um, it also seeks to situate our bodies gathered, hopefully, in space as well as time in wealthy Western colonial fortress Europe. Um, so as a document, the CJC is a starting point to collectively understand, to collectively understand the system. Um, we're going to be looking at, uh, sh should I, have I gone on for a long time? I've gone on. It's good, it's okay. Okay. Um, mm -mm. Yeah, I, I guess I wanted to say at, at the end of the course, it's our hope that there's going to be more fluency in the histories and the way in which uh, the climate crisis connects to climate colonialism, um, how the systems are functioning today, and also how the arts are central to these hegemonies, how the arts have been a central agent to climate colonialism as well as for climate justice. So we're going to be kind of interrogating that idea. Um, we also want to come to understand, uh, while we come to understand what climate colonialism is, we will also reframe the canon of what it is to make or practice art in a climate just way. And I think that's where uh, a number of our guests will um, be vital to kind of our centering and recentering and reframing of um, climate just practices, art practices, etc. Um, so on the one hand, if we're thinking about um, the, the work of art and aesthetics in this kind of climate colonialism um, idea, uh, you could think of uh, something I was reading about recently, but um, Tintin, for those of you who know that popular uh, colonial Belgian uh, cartoon. Uh, there was like a one, one edition of Tintin, which was um, Tintin's philanthropic journey uh, to the Congo. And I mean, what this was doing, of course, is being like heinously. We won't be looking at this because I don't think that's necessary. Um, but uh, this was working as a colonial uh, propaganda tool through which young Belgian kids were schooled on their ideological and uh, moral centrality in the world. And then so on the flip side, I'm thinking of someone that Ama has mentioned and is um, thinking around is Anna Mendieta, the Cuban performance artist who, um, who isn't held in the canon of climate just artists. And she was a performance artist doing earth work and body work. And, um, and so we're gonna be also bringing these people into the conversation also. So the, the subject is about an adjustment of our lens and focus. Um, the Climate Justice Code. Something I've learned about the Climate Justice Code is everyone who is involved with the code, and that will probably include all of our participants, uh, has a slightly different understanding on who or what the code is for and what it's doing, what its intentions are and how it might be implemented, enacted and instituted. That's almost one of the few things we can agree on apart from these central principles that I've described to you. Um, so right now the code is near its final draft moment. The next step for the Climate Justice Code Working Group is to develop the code with strategically uh, chosen arts institutions. Um, but the, the question that we're constantly engaging in is how best to implement and activate this code. Um, and this is where the study group comes in. I know I've kind of gone on about the code a lot because I'm not sure how clear it is and how jumbled it is, depending on how new you are to um, the Dutch context. Um, but the question of how we institute and activate the code really depends on who um, chooses to join us. So, um, for instance, by the end of the course, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I am from so-called Australia, the country known, popularly known as Australia. Um, and if, as joining the code, I, I bring the knowledge of like being a white settler colonial person and understanding 
perhaps not bodily, but understanding that the, the country from which I come from is um, unceded indigenous territory and it continues to be um, sovereign uh, many nations on the landmass known as Australia. So I bring with me this understanding, this situated knowledge to the Climate Justice Code and I, I question how, how I can put this code into practice perhaps through my art practice or um, in an Australian context or a Dutch context. Um, mm, 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 mm. Yeah, for some, the code will be an ally, a friend in hostile situations and an accountability tool between individuals. And for others, it might be a document with it which to lobby arts institutions, big and small in your home country, to challenge them to take specific steps towards decolonial practices. So to walk the walk, to not just talk the talk and try to kind of evacuate the politics from the aesthetics or in fact co-opt and steal the aesthetics in order to kind of claim to have a certain politics. Um, so, yeah, the, the code can do all sorts of things. <laughs> uh, we have only six weeks together before our final um, kind of presentations, etc. So we're going to be busy. Um, and I know I haven't spoken a whole lot about pleasure, but there's going to be <laughs> a lot of pleasure. <laughs> um, I really hope I haven't unpleasured you during this description. <laughs> that sounds kind of kinky, but... Um, uh, so... Yeah, as well as kind of getting, getting our heads into the code itself, we're going to be meeting, as I've mentioned, some pretty special artists and practitioners who are doing the climate justice work in this kind of reframed way that I've described. Um, we're also going to have student curated co-op evenings where we invite the students in to kind of bring their thinking, what they're learning around this concept um, to the group so that we can all kind of like do this work, of the re do this reframing work. Um, we're going to be thinking about our embodiment within the, the structures, these kind of painful structures, as well as the delightful structures and how we can kind of manoeuvre through. Um, <laughs> I have one point that says it's going to be a buffet of fun. <laughs> um, oh, uh, there's going to be a workshop called Joyful Fast Art, which I will share with you, which is a, um, a, an art practice. It's a... a, a a practice of making that I've come about, um, come to through. Uh, it's I orig originally making for me is a. I haven't introduced myself. Making is a grounding process for me, so it comes out of this idea of trauma and uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and not having a solid base, and not necessarily being able to count on conditions around me. So, with making and with engaging with something small, like a um, soft, squishy ball or the table that I'm sitting on, just to like engage with texturally and sensually, uh, how can this kind of material engagement um, bring me back to earth? and also kind of simultaneously build something that creates small, delicate uh, worlds that might um, tell stories in other ways. Um, mm -mm. I've skipped some things, but I'm also aware that I've gone on, so I would like to invite any questions, if anyone has them, and if we have time, we have a little bit of time, we have four minutes, Dutch style. Four minutes. Um, does anyone have any questions? Atu? I can repeat if you like. Oh, yeah, no, Nikos will. I feel like I'm about to be grilled by Atu. I know you're a climate just activist. Hi. Yeah, so we, we had a little uh, bit of discussion yesterday. Um, so uh, having a climate activist background, um, my main question is uh, the implementation of such codes um, with cultural institutions, the climate justice code. And um, I think the main question is how they will uh, divest or how they will um, how they will um, um, stop their sponsors, their fossil yeah f sponsors that are kind of engaged in fossil fuel industry. Um, 
So I think that is kind of the main question, and uh, there's a lot of activist groups working within the field, so maybe, um, maybe you can explain a bit how this collaboration looks like mm -hmm. with the working group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Um, so just to repeat, I'm not sure I caught the beginning, but you were asking about how the code works in relation to divesting from... Uh yeah, well, I think uh, uh, how... I mean, if we talk about this colonial relationships or climate change as a continuation of colonialism, uh, then you have all these multinationals who are... Mm -hmm. uh, put into place and they are funding the arts institutions mm -hmm. to kind of greenwash their image. Mm -hmm. So the main task, I think, from the climate activist perspective would be how to pressure the institutions so they will um, uh, stop the relationship with these sponsors. Mm -hmm. And then I understand also I like all the, the more soft skills ways how the institution works with the BIPOC artists and how they tries to maintain better relationships, mm. etc. Um, so you're talking about think, it's a question of lobbying. Yeah, or how a question of implementation because it's not, it's like these paths have been walked upon mm -hmm. already for years and years. So um, for me, it's not so open that the implementation can be in any way because basically uh, it's not an equal exchange like th the one who has more power is the one who has the most money or brings in the most money for example mm. um, yeah and how to change these relationships how to transform really these institutions mm. I think uh, that's the question mm -hmm. um, and how so how this CGC implementation then will actually work? It's just more of a yeah, critical question, comments. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think it's critical. I think it's a, a framing question. I mean, what you're asking is bringing your own interests in the climate just movement to the code itself. So the questions that you raise are actually something, if you were, for instance, to want to be in the group uh, or to be applying for the group, is um, this could be a question, this question of um, lobbying and individual art practice and collective practice and um, allyship, et cetera, uh, might be one that we would get in, involved in. But that's not actually the work, the act, that's, I mean, I would see that as a, as a kind of one of the potential uh, directions that the code may go in, but that's the work at this stage of the, of the code, it is certainly about um, uh, leveraging, et cetera, but the question of implementation uh, speaks to who's coming on board in the co-op, but if you're speaking uh, more broadly to the Climate Justice Code working group itself, um, it's when I say it's going to be, it's an accountability tool and that we've ar arrived at a place now where we have a first draft of the core principles. Um, and we're pulling out from these principles, questions, um, action strands. So within these action strands, there are going to be um, prompts, uh, but there's also an accountability element uh, within the code, a manual of use that then, for the, for the test institutions, for any institution to sign on to the code, um, it's our intention, it's not about doing the climate justice code, it's not a greenwashing thing. In fact, I think maybe you came in late, but this, this entire um, code is in fact working against, it's, it's not, and we discussed this last night, it doesn't see social practice and social artistic activist practice, uh, that's, that's not the work of the Climate Justice Code. It's the BIPOC artists who are, um, it's, it's the repatriation that needs to happen in the museums. It's the artists who are not being centred, for instance. And then with regards to kind of the social practitioners, if, uh, that's an action strand aspect. So if, if one wants to, um, I think I'm, I went in many directions at once. I need to backtrack. The implementation of the code, yeah, the manual of use, it's an accountability question. So the way in which we're going to unfold it with the, and put it to work with the institutions who have signed on, um, I'm not sure if I can talk about which ones now, but there are some pretty well-known Dutch institutions in there and we're focusing specifically on these wealthy Northern European 
institutions for obvious reasons, they can't just tick it off. They can't, these institutions who claim to be doing like climate crisis engagement or like anti-racist work or whatever, that doesn't mean shit unless they're actually doing the work. So to sign on, they have to do the work. And the work is, um, well, like some of the work is the divestment from the kind of looking at their funders, looking at their board, looking at their staff. It's not about being a perfect moral human being or institution because, of course, everyone is entangled and that's what this subject is about. It's, it is about the mess. Um, there's no such thing as a, um, as a morally um, kind of... Uh, there's, there's, no, there's no Tintin in the world. Um, and so it's kind of... It's an accountability tool that's going to be lobbied uh, from, kind of leveraged from below, but simultaneously with the institutions that I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, such as Platform Bicar, Fossil Free Culture, uh, Commons Network and Code Rod. Um, it's also a lobbying tool, if we want it to be, if we want it to be with the people who are participating. It's like... A, it, uh, who described it? Someone described it as a... Is there anyone Scottish in the room or Irish in here? Or oh, English? Um, what was that agreement, the peace agreement? Was it the Irish peace agreement where everyone had a different idea of how it could work? The Good Friday agreement. Yeah. Um, thanks, Rory. Uh, so... It's a movable feast. Uh, it's its own... It's its outcome is not specifically divestment. That is one of the many possible outcomes. Um, and that, that would be something that comes from if it can get to, if we can leverage it to an institutional level in the same way that some of these other codes, the Fair Practice Code, for instance, in the, in the Dutch context, um, have been taken on and then implemented from above and put to work through, for instance, uh, Mondrian Fund, you know, they then, uh, this becomes a, full, a requirement that other institutions uh, need to uh, follow. So, uh, yeah, there's... Uh, yeah? Okay, cool. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, everyone. Here and afar. Thank you, Clementine, for this uh, enlightening and thorough introduction. Thanks for bringing to us also the ones that will be joining throughout the year um, and that could not be present here. Thanks, Mariana, as well, for joining us. And we, as a member also of the CJC team, but also as a frequent, let's say, partner in crime through the whole relation with Casco as well, because Mariana is also very much active within the whole uh, structure of, uh, of how Casco operates. It's a really core member of the team. Um, um, something to just um, inform you about, and I forgot, please uh, forgive me for not making it very clear. We have received for almost all of the COPEs uh, all their, let's say, blurbs and introductory um, statements. That's what AMA was also introducing, hoping that you have seen it. It has been uh, for us quite essential that we are able to share that at one specific moment, all of them to all of you, following the presentations as well. So you will be able as first and second years really navigate through a big constellation of different trajectories that are equally at the same momentum shared with you together maybe with the presentations that we're recording right now, so you will be able to actually consider which cope you might be finding your place in and shape those uh, small, let's say, um, motivations. Again, for the first year students, three cope uh, suggestions, and for the second year students, two cope suggestions. And I repeat again, because I think that's very important to think um, to everyone's minds, including us, which have to constantly be reminded, please keep in mind to, to imagine finding yourself in one of these either three or two 
cope constellations. Uh, it's, it's very important to, to do so. So be partially argumentative on yourself. Measure, you know, the potentiality of uh, that could generate an interesting dynamic. That's a field that might be unknown to me, but I'm interesting to work around. Uh, or like be in and be with that, let's say, uh, um, let's say maybe partial uncomfortability. I think uh, I'm drawing also from what Marwa, um, from curating positions that they introduced, mentioned as well, that they are addressing the cinematic, but it opens in a very broad scope of what you define as cinematic. We, we don't, they don't expect students that, that carry a skills in editing and filming. And I think what Clementine also introduced today was also really briefly elaborating on what the uh, climate justice code is, how you will be working with it, but in relation also to AMA addressing uh, issues of care, uh, reparation, um, and so much more, bringing also artistic practices and, um, and how this, um, let's say, elements work together or try to question how they can all, um, in a sense, frame uh, a study group that it's not um, that opens up to other possibilities, including also student-led activities. So maybe that is important to remind ourselves. Every COOP is inviting the members of the group to also act as tutors. So in a sense, every student or constellations of students within the COOP are asked to lead a moment. That means bringing their own energies, their own knowledges, their own languages of thinking and working and practicing through the COPE, under, of course, the overriding framework of what, let's say, the general um, thematic study is for the year to come. Okay, that being said, uh, maybe we take five minutes break um, to get coffee. Maybe for the ones that are joining on live stream, hopefully, uh, can also get a coffee from the resting Landal houses. Um, and we'll be returning um, with Frances Ruiz that is with us and with coming from the World Wide Web, uh, Julia Morandera, the two uh, core team members of um, uh, a study group. I will not mention the partner now, I will leave you to take coffee. I will introduce them when we return back. Thanks again and see you in a bit.
Um, to begin with, uh, just a few words to say that I'm really, really sorry to not be in there with all of you, especially with First layer, this is like uh, the first and found Netherlands.
Who? Boom. Okay, maybe we take our seats um, so we can continue with the last presentation for the day. Are we live streaming? All right, I'm on TV right now. Okay, fantastic. So, I welcome everybody back. Uh, and the ones that have been joining from their comfortable houses at Landau, or alumni, potential students, pot not, not potential, incoming students that might have not been able to join us um, here, as well as second year students and maybe some graduates that were not able to come and feel nostalgic. Um, I'm excited to introduce um, the final presentation for today for, our up, for in the side of the COPE study groups. Um, I'm excited, we are excited to renew partnership with uh, State of Concept um, an art space, uh, think tank, uh, I wouldn't call it institution, it's a non-profit uh, art cultural, cultural space in Athens, um, led by Iliana Fokianaki that has been quite a comrade and participant in several components of our program through the last years. Uh, since last year we have initiated officially a partnership with State of Concept. Um, and State of Concept brought to us uh, uh, two amazing uh, contributors uh, as a lead tutors for the team. Um, last year, uh, they led a COPE study group called Chusma, a Dirty Editorial, which are still to see their presentation, which will be coming uh, tomorrow. Um, and what they have been working for this year is actually uh, what they call Chusma 2.0, a coalition of gossips. Um, please again then to welcome um, Frances Ruiz that is here with us to take part of the lead of the presentation and then give also uh, the virtual, let's say, uh, pass to Julia Morandeira uh, I have to say Julia was very much planned to join us. She was really eagerly looking forward to it, and I think she will address it also on her note. Unfortunately, she comes from Madrid, and conditions in Madrid did not allow her to be with us. It was a constant discussion uh, of whether we should really invite her. Uh, codes changed, colors changed in countries, from yellow to orange, from orange to red, and so forth. So we thought it's, we really made a common decision to really not um, have her fly and join us. Uh, but you will certainly get to meet her soon. Iliana, as a um, uh, director of State of Concept, is also sending like her regards and is looking forward to hopefully meet you in the future. She was also unable to come because there have been also several obligations that were blocking her from doing so. Um, but this is more or less what I have to say for that final constellation uh, of the day with regards to COPE. Frances, the floor is to you. Uh, let's give applause to the 30 people we are here so we get the spirits high. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, let's, I, I'm, I'm going to see what I prepared some PowerPoints, some videos. Uh, I mean, I don't know how I will manage all, everything, but okay. Uh, my name is Frances Ruiz. I'm part of Chusma uh, uh, group. Uh, Chusma that this year is uh, is called a coalition of gossips, uh, and we are in part of a state of concept uh, uh, co-op here in in Atai. Uh, Today I'm here alone, but I mean, I'm really missing Julia Morandera, that is like the one who is behind the whole Choose My Concept. I'm the one who is illustrating in many ways the, the Choose My Concept. I don't know if you know what it means, Choose My. We will be 
talking about this later, okay? But I will, first I want to introduce myself. I'm an artist, I've been working on art for almost already 25 years. Uh, and I've been doing artistic practice, but also I've been really involved into all kinds of collectives. No, I, just to tell you, I mean, I've been since the, in the end of the 90s, I was part of a uh, experimental curatorial team in Barcelona that we were doing like, like micro interventions, micro exhibitions in, in the city of Barcelona. It was called Creatures. Uh, and I did it with Amanda Cuesta, Gloria Pou, and uh, Maribel Lopez. And then, um, uh, already in 2000, I start with Efren Alvarez, also a group, like a working group, a studio group. It was called uh, uh, Radical Drawing Group. And it was, we were meeting like uh, once a week in a, in a very um, interesting bookshop, kind of also radical bookshop in Barcelona. Just meeting to draw and to try to understand drawing from, from a radical perspective. Uh, and also, uh, uh, I've been part of a queer and feminist fanzine uh, that I did with uh, Maite Garballo and Ferran El Otro. And we did like three issues, uh, and we were, it was very interesting in terms to, um, Maite is an academic into feminism, and it was super interesting to, to go deep into the, to the subject from my point of view at that, that period of time. And the last collective I've been joining, I mean, I've been part of it, uh, is, is it called, uh, it's also based in Barcelona, and it's called the uh, Instituto de Estudios del Porno. So it's like the Porno Studies Institute. And we are three members, it is me, uh, Ona Bros, and Lucia Egaña. And we try to uh, focus on uh, all the development, development of porn studies from the, the point of view of the South, uh, we call it porno, and very specifically uh, uh, from the production that uh, um, all the post-porn production produced in, in Barcelona during the last years. So we are really working, doing workshops, uh, screenings, uh, so we are, we are trying to develop a, a, a program every year. Uh, now I want to, you know, this is kind of all the collective work I'm doing, and I have to add that very, you know, l last year was a very intense collective work with Julia Morandera, my, my, my colleague here, like, uh, uh, as a tutor of, of, of this COP. Uh, but also I wanted to introduce my, my practice as an artist. I've been really interested in comic books. I've been working with comic books as a medium, as a tool, uh, to, uh, to do very specific research in the things I'm interested in. Uh, so one of the, uh, I mean, I have 25 years of career, so I've been changing a little bit, and I've been evolutioning a little bit, a little bit. but I'm really obsessed with some uh, specific area of research in comic books, is those comic books that are to have the content is LGBTQ plus, uh, but I mean, uh, it's all these queer comics, but that are created by people, mostly straight people, the people from outside the community, the LGBTQ uh, community. So uh, basically, I've been doing that, a lot of research on this. Uh, this like kind of a history, a genealogy of this kind of comics. You can go to, uh, for example, to. I don't know if you know something about uh, erotic fume Italian fumetto, something like was like a phenomenon in the 80s in, in the southern Europe and also in America Latina uh, that were really, you know, something like big. Uh, but it never arrived to northern countries, but it was something like a, a, a very uh, interesting uh, mm, way to distribute ideas about uh, the beginning of the uh, of the sexual liberation movements in the 70s. Uh, also, I'm very interested in, I don't know, yaoi manga. This is this kind of manga, also uh, uh, queer content by gay, but mostly gay, but produced by woman for woman. And it's something like it started in Japan, and then uh, now it's kind of a global thing. And uh, also I've been doing research more recently uh, into the, the uh, very uh, specific subculture of manga, it's like the Korea manga, uh, Lily manga, that is like a lesbian content manga in, in South Korea. So I've been like 
identifying different cultural products. I'm also very interested in Libro Vaquero in Mexico. Also, how they depict like uh, uh, other, uh, you know, like sexual diversity and gender, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, and gender diversity also. Uh, yeah, I will show you some images because I mostly I work with installation. Uh, so I, what I do usually, all these kind of researchers, uh, what I do is like uh, I create installations, like simulating bookshops, uh, simulating the spaces I'm very interested in. Is this kind of a, the comic bookshop? The comic bookshop as a space of people meeting together, uh, as a space of uh, where some uh, some communities uh, communities uh, find a place to stay, like a, sometimes a, a safe space. So this is like an installation I did uh, already like 10 years ago, I guess, in Gasworks, London. Okay. Uh, so basically, it was like uh, uh, it wor it's working. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So basically, it's like the recreation of a bookshop, of a Yaoi bookshop. Uh, but very, uh, I asked to the people, the women who were working in in Gasworks at the time, because all the team who was like, dealing with the, with the structure of Gasworks is a small. As artist art center in, in London, to if they let if they if I can uh, make at the tournament of the the whole structure and also all the people who was working there in order to create a fiction of a community of manga, uh, yaoi manga producers, and it was totally focused on the context. This is something I really like to do always to go uh, to do um, site specific projects that really uh, are really related to the space where, uh, uh, where, where are they shown. So this is like some images of this bookshop. This is the opening day. But basically, all the fanzines, all that were like almost like 5,000 fanzines, uh, with different covers, different colors, uh, they were, I mean, they were like, uh, they were all the covers, uh, were making like a, it was they were like trying to explain what was going on in the neighborhood where where gas work was was uh, that neighborhood is Boshol. Boshol is a very specific like in the gay neighborhood in in South London, and so it's like I create this kind of community of uh, manga producers uh, that. Uh, suddenly decide to install this bookshop in downtown. Uh, in, in Boshol, and uh, in order to, you know, pay attention to what's going on around and all the gay scene of the area, and in order to depict in, through all this gay scene in their fan scenes. So this, these are different images of the space. The thing is, these 5,000 different fan scenes, uh, con the content of these fan scenes is always the same. It's a, the same comic that shows What's going on on this small community of women uh, producing uh, manga yaoi? No, so it's about the all the green uh, spaces that uh, generate the the, the the yaoi manga subculture. Uh, when you, you when you suddenly uh, land land in a in a space like a, a gay neighborhood, so it's a lot of misunderstandings. Uh, how uh, I show in the this is like yeah this is the interior. I mean this is part of the comic where they is like the the two of the members of this community, like uh, yeah I don't see it here sorry but yeah I mean yeah they are there inside the bookshop. They go outside just to uh, take documentation with of the of the bars of the gay scene in order to then to create their own comics. So it's about kind of a, a strange uh, relation of someone of some community who is kind of a symbiotic way, like uh, paying, like uh, taking inspiration from another community. So uh, I've been doing uh, more recently a similar project in 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 Korea, but more focused on. Uh, the Lily Mangwa producers, that is like uh, lesbian comics for lesbian audiences. This is also, I've been very interested in, I've been creating a lot of newsstands. Uh, I think I'm very interested in uh, uh, newsstands as, you know, I'm very interested in printed matter, as you, as you say, and publications, and how the publications are, are distributed. Uh, 
and how to show in a in a you know you know kind of a exhibition space how to show publications not not only the book not only the single publication how to articulate uh, spaces uh, and architectures about that so i've been doing these bookshops also i've been doing these newsstands in different cities also understanding uh, the newsstand as a kind of a community also uh, to understand it as a kind of a um, uh, for me are metaphors of the cities where i show you and then uh, i show them uh, this is like the one I did in, 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 in Venice, in Italy, and it's really uh, about, you know, trying to depict the, how is actually a, a, a newsstand in, 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 in Italy or in Venice. And th so I just, I mean, it's like a, no, oh, sorry. Okay, now. So um, I, I really like to understand newsstands as a kind of, uh, um, uh, for me, are, are very similar to uh, tarot card reading. When you go uh, in front of a, of, of a newsstand, you see a lot of information, and I think it's, they could be read as a really kind of a, uh, uh, in, in a very, you know, to interpret them like we interpret like the, the tea leaves, no, also. Uh, and also, I like to decline and activate all this, the content of all these newsstands by adding speech balloons, and in order to create kind of a, uh, like, like the magazines are revolting themselves and they are like and they have decided not to be an object anymore and they have decided to talk by themselves. So, well, this is like, yeah. Okay. Also, in terms of publications, I've been really interested in working on distribution uh, system, systems. Yeah. Uh, this is some also, I mean, I've been, I like to create circuits with publications. That means like a, how I can create a publication ring in a very specific area or a space. Uh, I can, this is this kind of, I'm creating this kind of publications that work, they work like a kind of a, under a, a treasure hunting structure. So one publication that takes you to another publication, to another space and another publication. And then some, to create kind of a, uh, publications and a guided tour, but also kind of a high hidden structure, a hidden system that sometimes like uh, uh, you cannot find in the uh, you know in the typical places. So you can t you have to find some people to be in touch with some communities to ac to have access to these publications. So this is a performance I did in also in Venice, where there were some people distributing a comic. It was a parody about. Uh, uh, about the biennial itself, uh, and I was creating like a parallel, like uh, as biennial, uh, really focused instead of artists, there were like comic artists showing the in the pavilions, and really uh, trying to bring back the memory of two main, I mean, for me, uh, very important figures in the history of uh, uh, queer comics in Italy like Rolando del Fico or Gary de Succhia, two characters that nobody remembered anymore. Uh, so I just uh, bring them back uh, uh, in, in this kind of a circular structure, uh, using these small publications and fanzines inside the, the Venice Biennial. Uh, so it's about like, f it's a comic of five installments that are really, it's like a photo novel located uh, in the different pavilions, but changing like the content what you usually find in the, in the Venice pavilions with their own sausage language. Uh, well, this is part of the salami or tuna salami, of course. Yeah. So, okay, then more recently, I've been very interested in working on distribution, but not only into publications, but I've been quite obsessed with what it means like the circulation of uh, commodities uh, and yeah, merchandise and in, this, in the global system in the, in, in, from a global point of view. And uh, it's, it's, it's been like, a, a, I don't know, something like being obsessed. I've been collecting a lot of images, videos, that for me, they follow what I call kind of the, the dance of the capitalism. And I will show you like a, a little, a small video that I've been collecting all these videos in my Instagram under the hashtag disturbing distribution because I really think like, you know, it's important to, I don't know, with all the images that we are 
navigating through, I mean, to um, and, and try to, to create another narratives. Uh, this is the video. Let's see if it works. Oh, sorry. I don't know. This. Okay, this is just uh, stop. Okay, this is just a fragment. Okay, this is more. Okay, and more recently, uh, uh, following. Oh, sorry. Following this, my interest in this kind of uh, disturbing distribution uh, uh, and this kind of uh, this, uh, things I've been detecting. Uh, and okay. Uh, So uh, I, I did like this, this big installation, just like uh, thinking about the, you know, uh, of all the things I've been detecting about the new kind of distribution I was experimenting in, in Barcelona or, or in Madrid where it was shown. So all the, the city about the different, I mean, this kind of a square that really depicts like the three uh, speeds in the city, you know, like the, uh, and there's like the, the blue street that it, it talks about, you know, how this kind of, like a mobile company that suddenly is like parasiting a lot of uh, downtowns in, in, you know, in, in a global way, uh, this telephone car companies, uh, company. And then also uh, the yellow street or the yellow level that is about uh, all the, the new logistics that suddenly we are experiencing, you know, in a very normal way. And it's, some, it's been something like a very, very fast transformation. And the last street is like the red street that the, of, of course, it makes reference to the to the red light districts and like uh, what it's. I mean, something like suddenly 
is also disappearing. So, okay. So I want to talk about now what, uh, how, how it was Chusma last year. Uh, Chusma, that um, later uh, Julia will explain a little bit what is, I mean, we will, will explain much better. So we wanted to talk about this idea of Chusma as, you know, this word, Chusma word is a, is a Spanish word that means like, uh, it's to define the others. The others one are worse than you. I mean, it means like the people who, you know, uh, the lower classes, the people who is dirty, who is messy, the people who, I mean, who talk too much, the people who uh, smells, the people who is too sexual. So it's about uh, this concept, you no know, chusma. You say, okay, that person is chusma, or that group of people is chusma. It's about a way to uh, to define the otherness, no? But also, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a way to define the otherness, but everybody used to define the others, no? And especially, I mean, it's been interesting how this, this word is being taken for, I mean, we were very interested to, from, the, from the point of view from uh, Jose Esteban Muñoz, the queer performance theoretician, theoretic, theoretic, yeah. and also we were very uh, interested in understanding this idea of excess, of con contagion, of, of, of dirtiness, no? that, that uh, for, for us was very, very important. So last year, we, have, we were lucky, we have a, a group of uh, very uh, amazing students that really uh, understand very well what was the concept, and they, they suddenly, they, I mean, we were pro um, providing some information about what it was and what we were planning to do, and of course, as Chusma is, it evolved, it evolved to other things. But we were, at the beginning, we wanted really to, to uh, structure the thing through uh, spaces like a beauty salon, as a space of where, you know, uh, a meeting space where, you know, we can play with the idea of, uh, of the wild uh, through, you know, makeup, hair, and these kind of things. Uh, also, we were starting uh, to think about uh, circuits and how to uh, disrupt circuits through, through our presence, through the Chusma presence, or identifying those circuits where things are not going well from, from, the, from the point of view of the others. And also, we were uh, very uh, interesting to develop from the first moment uh, this idea of correspondence following Ray Johnson work. Uh, and uh, that is something that at the end was very useful because after you know the lockdown, we were keeping send, going, we, we start some uh, correspondence chains, and it was interesting uh, to see how we were, we were still operating, even it was difficult during the, the lockdown. At some point, uh, we met together in, in Tunis, and it was an amazing experience, and I remember that as a very chosmatic experience because we. I mean, I remember it was the last time we were in a disco dancing. So for me, it was kind of a, yeah, like the last goodbye of a precious time. And also, uh, then when we changed online, suddenly we, well, we keep, we continue doing things, you know, through Zoom or all these platforms, but also we uh, decided to take it in, an, in many ways. And we did a, a porno pottery workshop also with the uh, Institute of uh, Instituto de Estudios del Porno. And it was very really interesting because we, uh, in, instead of using Zoom, we were using like platforms, like sexual platforms like mm, Chatterbait or Comfort. That was, for us, was very important just to, to go to one of the places. So now I will... Uh, we were also, I mean, after that, we were also working hard to create the, this, this project that we will see today or tomorrow, I still don't know. Uh, and, well, we will see all together later. And now I want to introduce you, you know, Julia, who is going to introduce like what will be the proper this year uh, choose markup. Hello, everyone. Um, to begin with, uh, just a few words to say that I'm really, really sorry 
to not be in there with all of you, especially with all the participants of the Truth My Roof of last year, 1920, at the RTA editorial, who are preparing this glorious, lack of a better adjective, performance that you will see tomorrow that has been carefully and widely prepared over the last few weeks more intensively, but that has been also in the making in the last months and even the last year. I feel really sorry not to be able to, to be there, to accompany them, to join, to perform with them. But I guess, uh, finally, as it seems, like being in Madrid and, and like get, taking into account like the urgency and the direness and the um, terrible situation that we, we're going through here um, with Corona, we are really the chusma of Europe at this moment. So it's better that I stay here. Anyway, I also wanted to give a warm welcome to the New Year's and of course, uh, welcome again to the new second years. So my name is Julia Morandeira. I'm a curator and researcher. I am based in Madrid. And very broadly to introduce my practice, I could define it that as a, I think like all of my different projects um, be there in like the different gestures, formats and, and forms that they have like developed under, they like a common thread that goes throughout all of them is that they try to problematize the epistemological foundations of Eurocentric modernity. That may sound very dense and very abstract, but I actually always like have approached these issues like through very material, very tangible, and actually very ambivalent stances, such as, for example, the body, um, forms of like triggering political imagination, and also through like the building of forms of institutionality. So like also my practice has a, a great um, space for building structures, infrastructures, forms of support, etc. You can, if you're more interested, we could like talk next time that we see each other, or you can actually like search it up online if you're more interested, like from the projects that, you know, have uh, gathered most of my time, have been, for example, Cannibalia, which is a research, a curatorial research that I developed throughout at least like five years around the figure of the cannibal and the logics of cannibalism as a force to reconfigurate uh, coloniality, past and present, other also forms of like ecological thinking, and of course, also other forms of like uh, body materiality. Another project, a more recent one, is the one on night studies in which I approach the nightly, the nocturnal in darkness as a form of like reconfiguration of the senses and the experimentation and the experiencing of different forms of categories that um, tap and relate to sociality, to the city, to politics of rest and sleep, to of course gathering, party, um, celebrations, and altered states of mind, etc. And then on the other hand, when like um, projects that dealt more with like founding structures, I wanted to just to share two with you. One is Escuelita, which was, uh, which is still, although now it's in a bit in a, in a critical state, like everything in, in the cultural institutions in Spain, but um, uh, Escolita is a research department that is a transversal organism situated at the Cados, the center of art two of May, the center of art of the community of Madrid. It was envisioned as a as a research department in which sort of like as a kind of like an octopus with different te tentacles, touch upon like the different issues that were being discussed in the programming of the center through the matters of the collection, but also like the different issues that were bubbling and were that present a certain urgency to be um, collectively tackled in Madrid. And also why not like the bringing of like international 
uh, discussions to the, the, this local uh, no, uh, um, space to be able to discuss it collectively. So it was a form of, it was a department based on collective forms of, of research that also advance the future programming of the center. And then most recently, actually like throughout this last year, and especially during the, during the lockdown and pandemic, I've been working very closely with um, CHEM Collective in Warsaw, Critica Politechnica, which is a, an NGO of, a, that translates as political critique, and my collaborator, Kasia Sloboda, all together, especially at CHEM, with um, Olani Kaszka and Alex Baczynski Jenkins, Kasia and me, we have been working very intensively in the design and the articulation of a new um, informal school and the program of this first edition centered on expanded choreography and trans feminisms or queer feminisms like this, the program of the first year, it's called How to Touch Movement, Body Materialities, Social Choreographies, and Queer Feminisms. And it will start and be launched in, eight, no, actually in September 2021, because we moved, moved it a bit. And I think like the title is quite eloquent per se, but we really wanted to, to work through the different urgencies that, or the different like shared terrains that, um, are located between um, the practice and the thinking, the embodied thinking of expanded choreography, and to stood as a very, as a much more wide practice that just like um, relegated to the field of dance or dance studies. We're thinking it like from a much uh, complex and uh, horizon, like and actually the, the program is free of charge. Uh, it, it demands you to move to Warsaw, and it's really we really like want to focus also on like to gathering resources for the region, but it's open for anyone who has an interest in the different subjects or in the politics and the issues that are tackling. And this so the sheltering between expanded choreography and queer feminism. So, so issues of touch, of attention, of perception, of sensoriality, of voice of movement, of control of the movement, of, of policy, of choreo policy, of choreo politics, biopolitics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It will soon, it's, it still hasn't been uh, announced, but it will be soon announced. And I wanted to introduce or um, on her behalf, because she cannot be here with us, um, Ileana Fokianaki. Ileana Fokianaki is the third tutor of our co-op. She is a curator and she's based between Athens and Rotterdam. Her research focuses on formations of power and then how they manifest under the influence of geopolitics, national identities and cultural and anthropological histories. Iliana is a great friend of mine. That's also how we came to the die and we came together to think in this, um, this recent, this yeah this uh, articulation of the of the research and even though this might be sound like very abstract you can for, for example uh, go and visit for those of you who can travel uh, in the netherlands her most recent exhibition a solo show of kapuani kiwanga at the, the at the formerly known as Vipedi. i hope i said it right anyway you know what i mean iliana fokinaki also and this is important to um, to understand the cop because it's a partner institution founded in 2013, State of Concept. State of Concept actually was the first known uh, profit institution of this kind in Greece. And it is located in the neighborhood of Ukaki. So it's really at the center of, of Athens, really near to the port. And it is beyond um, a self run space. It also functions as a platform that foster uh, especially like uh, there's a great attention put into critical debates that also functions as a on operates as a structure of support for the local context often pro bono, pro bono advice to artists on legal issues and and yeah i really 
I really encourage you to to go and visit. It's it's it works through exhibitions, through uh, public programs, through collaboration also with other institutions, and but also but also with a great um, a great accent put into long-standing forms of thinking of 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 becoming you know a, a, a hub where to think together and where to spread this the conclusions of thinking together into other forms of like social transformation so i think like we can actually get to um i think i mean to introduce him like what this new cop is going to be about so francesc dear francesc already has like presented you a bit where we came from, the Chusma Dirty Editorial, this wild and really assemblage, which was a, in which we, for the last year, we aimed to, you know, to uh, try to find different forms of definition of this impossible uh, definition, which is the Chusma. And this year, what we want to is to transition to the Chusma to another word which equally has been uh, equally bears a history of of ridiculization and of devaluation which is the word gossip gossip um originally now i mean i'll start again gossip like what we understand today by idle talk or by petty talk and talking, you know, uh, bad about someone or something around some other someone's back, actually has a completely like different different original meaning. And we're following here <clears throat> feminist historian and theorist Silvia Federici, <clears throat> who in her book Witches, Witch Hunting, and Women explains that gossip was used to refer a completely different thing. Actually, it meant women who engage in relations of friendship and cooperation. Sorry, a bit of water. So gossip actually had little to do with, you know, this actually derogatory um, meaning, but actually had to do with like a structural form of like <clears throat> of complicity and and support. It was a women's network of support action, mm -hmm. and basically as it was in the case of witches, you know, the gossips because you could actually use it like um, in the same way to refer to the group, to the practice, and to the woman that was practicing. It was a always like we're, we're saying gossip it's a feminized term and this is going to be also important to understand the logics um behind the the, the cop that we want to 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 work on this year so gossip were groups of independent women also, also. we're talking here around the 13th and 14th century who invested in the social power of the group being part of gossip was being part of of this network and social space based on bonds of female sociality and solidarity. Of course, uh, at the turn of the 15th century, and especially at the 16th century, which you know is this um, dark times in which the triad between uh, capitalism, colonialism, and modernity start to function together. The enclosures of the common lands start um, dispossessing Forms of living that were um, dependent on the common on the commonality of of production, of life together, of resources. All at the same time, the the enclosures um, were the start of the uh, of the primitive accumulation of of wealth, and of course on the division of of production, productive and reproductive labor, with the installment again of the private and public um, space uh, imposition, no? in which the women was relegated to the reproductive uh, world of the domestic. So at having this uh, context in, in mind, and, uh, and 
this new formalization of patriarchy emerging. In the case of, of this, these self-assertive groups would be the target of misogynist campaigns of social chastism. Right now. And this is like really clear, for example, at the in the, in the, in the records and the chronicles of the time, from, I mean, not just from that time, not from the 16th century, but actually until, and especially in the 18th and 19th century, but actually until nowadays, a few a few years back now, we will show you some artworks that dated from 1970. So that actually like in which the representation of, of, of gossips picture as aggressive, quarrelsome, especially loud mouths, no? the question of, of the talk, drunken, domineering, shameful, all maids especially, uh, it's going to become a, a, a common thread and a, and a common space. No? This idea of aggressiveness, of violence, no? is something that shouldn't be performed or shouldn't be in the hands of, of feminist subjects, of, of, of subjects understood as, as women, no? and, 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 so, um, and consequently is a reason for them to be uh, subjected. The idea of like loud mouths and and and, and drunken was also like a, a very important common thread of this of this uh, representation and this narrative, like this misogynist uh, mystic narrative. No? Because it's true that the gossips, the form of like um, affinity and of complicity and friendship was built in the coming together and the spending time together and the talking about like common uh, concerns and problems and helping each other through that. So it's basically this talking between women that is going to be targeted as an, as, as, a, as a danger, you know, as something that is that endangers the problem, the, the hegemonic um, structures and that needs to be demonized. So you're going to see now that I'm going to show you a small video, how the tongue, the mouth, the the talk is going to be an, an incredible um, center or intensity of this representation and of this of, of this narrative that we would really want to actually like work throughout the year. No, how this talking, this variety can be can be subversive. This actually this is a completely <laughs> line of flight, but. Poet Ocean Wong says that the future is, we always say that the future is in our hands, but actually the future is in our mouth, no? So how to actually reclaim and, and yeah, and take back this, this capacity of future shaping and working that is in our mouths, that is in our dirty um, uh, mouths. The issue of, of, of drinking, it's also going to be like a, uh, another another common thread. This is because like women are going to women are are going to be secluded and shut off from taverns, which are going to become a, a masculine space, and which before it was allowed for for women and especially for women to to amuse themselves to spend time together. And it's going to be another element of criminalization and of demonization. Of course, the idea of shame is also very present here, but well, the idea of, of, and then of course, all the other forms of subjectivation, and most notably, for example, ageism. So let's check a bit this video. Okay. Lamento haberte amado desprecio aquel cariño y maldigo el momento en que te conocí. Víctora, ese nombre te han puesto porque en el alma lleva el veneno mortal. Víctora, ese nombre te han puesto porque en el alma lleva el veneno mortal de la calumnia y la maldad. So this is 
um, a video actually focusing on the representation of, of, of the viper, of the women viper, no? or the, like in which the tongue becomes a, the, the viper, which is a, just like a strand of the, of the forms of representation mm -hmm. I was telling you before. Okay, going back to, I'm going to show you Cornell's, no? So going back to, to, to Federici, she concludes this all, all the time we're talking about one of the chapters of this book, which is really short and, and easy to read. And it's as Federici sometimes does, no? She's, it's, she, it's, 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 basically, it's a provocation to think, to think further and to take um, this analysis further in which to, in, through tracing how the, the evolution of the of the forms of um, of defining or designing uh, the words used to design one thing. So she concludes. You can read here with me. Gossip today designates informal talk, often damaging to those that are its object. It is mostly talk that draws its satisfaction from the responsible disparaging of others. It is circulation of information not intended for the public ear, but capable of ruining people's reputation, and it's unequivocally women's talk. It is women who gossip, presumably having nothing better to do and having less access to real knowledge and information and a structural ability to construct factually based rational discourse. Thus, gossip is an integral part of the devaluation of women's personality and work, especially domestic work, reputedly the ideal terrain on which this practice flourishes. So, what I wanted to, uh, what we want to do with this COP, which is going to be titled Truth Map 2.0, A Coalition of Gossips, is to trace the histories ascribed to the word gossip and to other similar ones. Now, this is to, we're going to see which other words have had this plastic. Um, this plasticity, sorry, not plastic, but plasticity of ascribing, of sticking um, different meanings and, 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 and significations to it. You know? Judith Butler always says that queer is actually like a sticky um, word in which the different meanings stick to it. Gossip is very similar. Is very similar. And these are the questions that, at least from the start, we want to, to, to trigger or work together. Would it be possible to reinstitute the regional force of the gossip by reversing its contemporary significance? Is it possible to reappropriate the power of words and consequently language itself? Can we create feminism, feminist structures through the circulation of information, ideas, affects, and solidarities? What forms, tools, and tropes of operating with contemporary and future gossip means? We will explore these two questions through these two questions, through practical research, debate, and case studies, including, um, well, I'm going to go through this a bit, no, actually no, visual analysis of demonization of subversive drawings, um, rumorology and, distri and disturbing distribution, the formation and operate operativity of coalition and support structures, forms of organization or, or tactics of, better, of organization and strategies from the abolitionist and transfeminist movements, languages and codes of clandestinity, analysis of forms of violence and collective defense, feminized forms of living and forms of radical vitality and joy. So we hope to build a contemporary archive of gossip as a practice that will allow us to imagine life together otherwise for an intersectional feminist collective practice. And just here is a small, um, this is uh, to finish this picture I took in, in, in Athens, in the University of Athens, now five years ago. But I think it's so, you know, quite eloquent. So um, I just wanted to conclude my part explaining to you a bit of the structure and the formats. It's for, I think it's really important for us to really um, underline that um, the way we want to envision and to organize the COP is like really through a practical 
collective research. This means that we really believe in Dewey's um, another uh, yeah, uh, ethos of like learning through doing or learning by doing. Um, I think like also like we live at a time of of corrosive skepticism um, of great like theoretical sometimes uh, I think I feel like theory it's like uh, sometimes like you know, needs more harm, more harm than that good so we really want to work through theory through politics through debates through a very uh, practical uh, um, stance through like a really embodied practice and also through many forms of, of debate. But I think it's like really important that we're really going to think and translate and to um, approach and tackle all these issues always through some forms of practical research, be it more manual or more um, um, other forms of like not so more, more cognitive research, but that is going to really be at the center. We want to structure the, the each week through different weekly subjects that are the ones that I already listed before, but there's going to be two um, key or, or two fixtures of a format. One is the correspondences that um, Frances is going to introduce later, maybe just when I finish. And the other one is the beauty salon, which is a space that we we started last call, although we only really managed to do one session. And for here, we, I, I wanted to actually like detail it and work it a bit more thoroughly and, and for it to become actually like a, um, um, a space that happens every time we gather. So this, the beauty salon is actually a space for mutual teaching and learning. It's for in each session, one of the, the participants will teach a quotidian individual or collective practice relating to care, beauty, or gossip. Okay, so it's a way. In a way, we could understand it as a way to divert this student led but it's also like a, a space of where people can ask for things to learn, and others can actually share the the technique or the knowledge of something they know. And yes, I think, I think. I think that's it. Um, thank you very much. I'll leave it here. And I leave you with Frances. Hello. Uh, thank you, Julia. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I just want to. Uh, this is, a, I mean, uh, Julia just introduces one of the what we will do during the year. And I also want to introduce the other part. I mean, one thing is the beauty salons, and the other thing will be like the correspondences. So basically, our uh, we want to uh, to do it together, like uh, to, to start working um, practices of correspondence, but following. Uh, the legacy of Ray Johnson, uh, that is someone we are still learning, uh, someone who want to learn more about. Uh, uh, sorry. Okay. So as you know, uh, Ray Johnson was the the the, 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 per the person who invented like the the male art. Uh, he did in the he started in the 60s like this uh, New York Correspondence School that he all, very often referred to that as correspondence. So it's like kind of a choreography of things and movement. I really like this kind of poem he wrote when he says like uh, male art. Uh, is not a square, a rectangle, or a photo, or a book, or a slide, it's a river. So it's about this idea of movement and distribution. So we will work about circuits and systems and how to distribute things. But very in, taking inspiration from the very spe specific and uh, special work of uh, Ray Johnson, someone who was really uh, obsessed with you know communicating with the others, with the whole scene at the time, that also almost in a kind of a paranoid way, that uh, we are really um, interested to 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 understand uh, his practice under uh, this idea of 
paranoia, but taken from from uh, Ip Kostovsky Sedgwick that I was really looking for to, to, to do to go deep in his work. Also about what uh, means for I mean for for him at the time this kind of uh, queer criticism and also this idea of how he he was developing all a world of communication through using camp uh, camp ideas, using the idea of the, the fan club, that for me is very important, this idea of Shelley Duval fan club. He was also in, always introducing in his correspondence this idea of the fan club. But also this idea of controlling the network also he was like creating. So it was something we will, uh, we will work about. Just to finish, uh, also it was very important in terms of what it means to disrupt, you know, like the distribution of the art. Uh, the, the, the performance he was often doing, it was called, the, the, he called, it was, well, they were named nothing. So he often, he was doing nothing, you know, so, and, and I think it will be very interesting in order to disrupt what we usually do. Just to finish, I want to, uh, show a video we did like some months ago before the lockdown uh, where with one of our correspondents changed from last year and um, okay also it will give you an idea of what Chusma is First layer, this is like uh, lost the and found lost and found Netherlands. Is it real or? Yes, it's real. It got lost in the. Like Ian gave it to Fran and then yeah. Fran lost it on the way to, uh, to the aeroponic. It smells funny already. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think this one is. Who put the fish in there? There was a fish in there. Well, yeah, it's gonna be just guess you. Okay, that's the it first layer. Yeah. No. This is what Francisco. Yeah. Come on. Francisco. Or Georgios or, or, or Georgios, of course. <laughs> no, you, you are the physical <laughs> guy, come on. Of the, of the, of the call. <laughs> okay, sure. let's, let's give it the... Okay. Ah, smells strange, yeah. No, but that's... Yeah, that smells... Um, wow, what is this? It was My God. Cool, 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 cool. come. This is yeah, like a it's, well. it's like what? Yeah, it's wet. That's why. It's so wet. this, I mean, it was sent to some to somebody like this. Somebody yeah. like, yeah. even no. like that. No, no, this is this is my wrapping. So this is the last. Okay. Wow, well done. But it smells strange. Oh my God. It's just like, I think uh, it smells uh, f because it was sealed for a very long time. Okay, so we have to open this. You can just to pull it Whoa. straight from here. Oh, it smells bad, oh. really. If you <laughs> take this, I think you take this off. Well, bad. that's a real... Uh, it smells really bad. Oh. Yeah, well, we wanted to stay here. We have there you go. Fuck. You ask for it. Oh, yeah, it's really good. You ask for it. It's just the latex. No, it's... Okay. The <laughs> like, because oh. you the... Mixed the latex and the fish, yes. No, but also the yeah, men yeah. jail. <laughs> this is the first layer? <laughs> yeah. No, like, like this is my reinstallation. Oh, it's true. It's true. And this is Miguel. Oh. No, it's true. I think with this, here. It's like it's been here. It's like part of our journey. Well, we started with this, like, yeah. Yeah, Okay, this is uh, yours. This is from who? Oh my God. Oh, this is for you? No, I did this reinstallation. I just did two layers because I didn't know what to do. <laughs> okay, this is Clara. So Clara sent it to you, yeah? <laughs> I sent it to Clara. <laughs> From the underground. <laughs> <in> the <laughs> here. <laughs> oh my god. He's kind of, he's kind of a, kind of a fetish, a strange fetish, yeah. Well, no, uh, a medical yeah. fetish, yeah. very hot like, for the times. I don't times. know, yeah, this is like very kind of, uh, no? Yeah. Medical. Yeah, kind of medical surgery, or... 
Like that's a bit of like, yeah. Okay. It's like That's nice. Dad. Okay, so this is it. Open it. Yeah. Yeah. That's black hole. Let me find that. That's a new thing. Oh, this is the... Shit. You know, well, no. Oh, what is this? Oh, no. It's a symptom of corona. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is a lot of Corona. Julia said that she doesn't smell. It's from the first generation Corona. Oh, wow. This is the yeah, probably, no? Yeah. All this. My God. So what? We receive it like that. We receive it like this. No, but it didn't work with the post. And then it didn't work. They were confused probably from the post. Oh, my God. Turn it around. Turn it around. Oh my god. It's moving, no? No, I don't like it. Okay. No, like he sent it and it didn't arrive. And then he gave it to Fran. And then Fran lost it. And then we got it from the lost and found. And I just repacked it. Oh, that's my package. I think the film will be smoked at one. No, this is the one with the fish. Which one? I think is the it's one the one with the fish because several people have this kind of problem. Who would put fish in a package? Come That's on. Quite... No, leave the plastic like, so like the, uh, the plastic, yeah. Because the plastic is connected to the latex. <laughs> No, no, now it's just after this oh, is getting really hot. Okay, that was yeah. arrived at the pillar. That yeah. was yours. Yeah. Ah, now it's not. It's not there. That's the eyes, but the eyes are not there. Yeah. yeah. But it's like oh, yeah, dry fish. Yeah. <laughs> you want oh. gloves? <laughs> Fuck. Nasty. <laughs> Man, this is my dream. Finally, you get it. Ah! What the hell is this? Oh my god. I don't know. Who is this? Pull it out. 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 Juicy. Ah! <laughs> this is rotten. Something is rotting. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> okay, so this is what it was. Okay. And okay. It continues. Okay, but we don't have uh, too much time. Just to finish, you know, uh, what uh, are we looking for? I mean, what kind of people we're looking for in, into our, our COP? You know, uh, we should apply uh, folks with a good attitude, curiosity, non prejudiced or polarizing, willing to experiment without shame, to really enjoy the time together. It's a space to allow yourselves to do, to say, to think without restrictions, and open to discussions with others. A willingness and disposition to learning through doing and with responsibility. Uh, we're looking for people interested in everyday practical intersectional feminisms, uh, and we believe trans feminism and queering are above all our praxis. Uh, people interested in organizing organization and practice in the political, social, and affective aspects of organizing, instituting, structuring, how to the issues of logistic and distribution can be found at the different scales from the bodily to the social to the macroeconomical. Uh, speculative imagination, feminist situated practice of co-responsibility with our present towards building better futures together and a willingness to collectively negotiate consensus and dissent. The COP is about collectively discussing negotiation and thinking. Okay, well, thank you. Whoop. Yes. Uh, thank you, Frances. 
thank you, Julia, from wherever you came from, um, for this thorough introduction also to who you are as a team, but also how the whole um, Chusma 2.0 will unravel, carrying also specific formats and practices um, from the uh, previous year and expanding them as a reason, even enhancing them, I would say. Uh, I don't know if I would really thank you for the last video, but uh, I think it was really indicative of directions that uh, Chusma is been not necessarily going to all the time, but really like embracing and tolerating and exploring. Um, important to remind that uh, we are still to come, we have still to come, choose my presentation, a dirty editorial, COPE Summit presentation that will be taking place uh, tomorrow in the afternoon uh, during lunch. Uh, or to be discussed and confirmed uh, or not confirmed, um, but we will keep each other, we will be, keep everybody updated. Um, we are here in the room, I think, uh, the exact amount of people. We're having uh, lunch that is served, so we kindly ask everybody to take their uh, lunch, and we're returning back at two with the start of the kitchen presentations, which will be quite a long endeavor through the whole uh, afternoon and evening um, covering up um, presentations of our second years with responses from graduating students and also uh, members of the tutorial teams of the new COP constellations. Uh, thanks again and we're back at two. Um, Lulu has something to announce or quest a question? Is there anywhere online that they can see the rest of the smelling video?
test, 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 test. Okay. Can we pass through this? Can we pass through Can we pass through this?
is the mic on? No. Is it on? Yes. Dear people in the room, and perhaps also people who are watching the live stream, I'm going to say some things, maybe also repeat them a couple of times to make sure that people hear them. Um, as you are completely aware of, we are very much improvising and trying to find our way with the new regulations. Um, and this night we have sort of rewritten the schedule, but there are still some dead ends where we have to solve some things because increasingly it's very difficult to think of any space where we can be together. Um, but first of all, for this space here at Radio Kootwijk, um, there are several rooms more now where people can be. I, I'm not sure if that has been clearly communicated. Uh, there is the two annexes outside. Do people know that they can go in the annexes? These, these small buildings on the other side of the pond. One, only one. Okay, here it says two, but only that it's rented if the rental people leave again, we can also have that one. So in principle, if there is people that you clearly do not recognize as die students, then those are the people renting that space, and otherwise it's for us. So these two buildings at the other side of the pond, we can use to sit. There is also um, a room that I just saw where five people can sit. It's a sort of boardroom. Um, you can do nice performance there. Um, it's called Panorama Kamer, and five people can sit there. It's at the end of the corridor downstairs, and it says clearly max five people, which is indicated for us. So five people can sit there comfortably at a table. One and a, but, okay, before I continue, we have already got another warning. People are not uh, respecting the one and a half meter. And they're still telling us that if we don't do that, it can still be cancelled, all of it. So please respect Peter, respect the one and a half meter. I'm joking. Um, so please also, because I don't know if I'm reaching now everybody, but share this, that we really have to be very, 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 very aware of doing this um, because I mean, every place we're thinking about, also where we do the, the farewell ceremony for the departing students, I mean, every place is like, oh my God, are they going to allow us? And the more <laughs> we sort of, you know, get into this situation that we're not, yeah, that's it. Uh, so the Panorama Kamer is available for max five people. Also something called the B room, but I don't know where that is. Maybe that's the big room where Chusma now is having that conference. That's maybe the B room. That's max 13 people. And then there are also, yeah, but that's not really an option. Okay, so these spaces are available here. I would like to make the following um, suggestion, or actually I think we should work like this. And I think I need all your cooperation. Let's make a deal. The, the, the tutors and the team have to be here to make all this work. Presenters have to be here. Their very best friends have to be here or their helpers have to be here. I want to suggest that every student who is here um, to enjoy and, and to watch at some point goes out and really make sure to find another student who wants to come in so that if you leave your place, we are sure that someone else can have your place for you know, some time. And if we make that a system, it's a bit of a chaotic system, but it could work. So you don't leave your place without finding someone else who can take your place. So then we are sure that the people downstairs you know, get, get, get a call. Like, you can come in now if you would like to. Uh, and if that person doesn't want, you go to the next one and you say, I'm leaving my seat, would you like to take my seat? If you all do that, then um, we are sure that there is a sort of care for each other, that everybody can be here and see part um, of the kitchens for real. The other thing is that we really, really need the, the, the BOAs, but unfortunately today 
um, um, the Chusma group is really rethinking. It's very sad for them because their COOP Summit 220 performance is the hardest one for us to realize now. So they are very much with their group thinking like, what can we do to make this happen? We have worked so hard for this. Um, meaning that we have a tiny bit of a problem with the occupation downstairs in the lobby and we do need permanently someone who counts who is going in and out. And I'm really calling now, because we can't organize this as we did with the BOAs, they're working for us, I'm, I'm asking for volunteers, actually. Um, many people, in, especially in the first year, came up and said, um, what can I do, what can I do? Well, this could be something to do, that we make sure that there is always someone at the reception, clearly visible, controlling who's going in, who's going out, counting, maybe also taking temperature. I hope the, the, the thermometer is there. Um, so, if this is not working, come up to us and tell us it's not working, we will have to make the call again. But it's extremely important. It's also, of course, showing to the people here in the building that we are taking care of the number. Um, you can communicate it to me, but maybe the best thing would just make sure to self-organize that we make sure there is always someone sitting downstairs doing it. And if you leave the place, you ask some others, could you take over for an hour? If, if you all do that, you know, then um, the only thing you need to do is really then for an hour be very sharp that you, that you see who goes in and who goes out. Um, I don't know. I don't know right now how... Uh, yeah, but I would say circulate. Huh? If, if you can organize that, that there is always someone there, you don't have to do it like for, for very long. So, I have no idea if there is someone that... No one, and that's not good. So, you start, fantastic. Fantastic, and if you take care that you then make sure someone else takes your place at some point. Fantastic, thank you so much. This is the spirit, this is really great. The same now again for the seats, so I count on all of you. I have another request that's actually not for the graduating students. Um, we're really struggling still with where we want to do the, uh, the farewell ceremony. Um, we can't do it here because we have 25 graduating students and at least the second year students should be there. That, that's really important. They have been working together and they should be, uh, be enabled to be part of a ceremony to say farewell. But that makes us already a quite big group. I also have to tell you that we have been doing a lot of research and we're on the right side of the law because we have the exemption for educational meetings. But the chaos is quite big all over the country and people are contesting this, but we have researched it, so we are in our right to have this meeting. Uh, also with more than 30 people. I'm just telling you that I'm in that conversation right now. Uh, it won't help us for now because I, I don't think they're going to change their attitude in this or their, their take. Um, but nevertheless, I, we are thinking of doing something at Landau, but we're also very wary that that is not going to be a good idea. So we make a call, and I'm especially addressing now the people, I'm looking at the camera, who are on bikes and touring this beautiful region. Can you do some, how was curating positions calling that? Uh, location scouting, how? <laughs> Scouting for locations, you've learned it in their class. We need a location where tomorrow around six, you know one, we need, we need to be able to also go there with a car because we have to bring things. So it cannot be something where you can only walk. So that's the condition. It should be a bit hidden, <laughs> preferably beautiful, Preferably out of sight. <laughs> and people should be able to access it in various ways. It's important that a car can go there, bikes can go there, and yeah, maybe also people go there by foot, I don't know. 
the one who comes with the brilliant location gets a prize. <laughs> it would be really helpful if we could find a place where, where we can think, okay, there we can at least relax for a moment and do our ceremony in the way we want to do it and bring the people that want to be present. Um, I know I'm now talking to the camera, I have no idea who's watching, so spread the news. I don't think it's the responsibility of, I'm looking at Anakin, of the third year students, we should do this for you, so you're not hearing this. Um, but I'm speaking to the second year and the, the, the first year students. If you're on bikes, use your eyes and maybe find this one incredible spot where, we, where there is still a road, but um, where we could be around six o'clock in the evening tomorrow morning. And the very best thing would be that it is a bit close to Landau, actually, because then we can go easily back to Landau, because tomorrow we will bring all the food to Landau with bottles of wine, and everybody has to eat and drink wine in their houses. That's the best way we can sort of have a communal dinner, but then in a lot of houses. Uh, so. This is the commission. I will repeat it several times because different people will come in. Spread the news. We're really, really grateful if people can think along with us about this. Okay, it feels really weird to speak to this empty hall. It's like we're waiting for <laughs> people. Are the presenters ready, Peter? Okay, five minutes. Yeah, five minutes before the kitchen.
give me a sign? Can we, are you ready? You're ready. Okay, I have to see who the, sorry, one moment. <coughs> So this is all. Um, one more practical remark after Erato and Georgia's presentation. Um, I would like to ask maybe Arthur, he was volunteering earlier with two or three more people, to take out the chairs, this was Nejanka's and Rory's idea by the way, to take out the more than 30 chairs that we are not, let's do it after the presentation Arthur, but it, it would look less depressing I think, we will not be missing so much the people that are not sitting there, it's really good, thanks. So we do that after, thank you. So. Um, it's possible, I tell this to our respondents, for uh, students to, do <coughs> to join, to do their presentation together. They get two times 20 minutes. It's not allowed to give us a 40-minute presentation because that's too tiresome. So we will have Georgia and Erato twice today at, at several moments and with, several, with different respondents. Um, so the respondents now are um, Rafael as graduate respondent, Rory and Snezhanka, and the presenters are Georgia Stelin and Erato Tsavara. Okay, so my question is, how do we leave traces on the water? 14 August 2020, day seven, Ayatriada, Peloponnese, Greece. The day started lazily. After a week of holiday, I finally felt relaxed. We decided to stay home till early afternoon. I had some pending stuff which needed my attention. Others did laundry. At around three o'clock we left and roughly an hour later, we reached the blue clear water of Aya Triada. We walked down to the beach and headed right. We stopped just before a big rock. It was lying there since ever. We took our clothes off and ran toward the blue. We swam around dived in, created circles with our body, swimming round and round. We climbed on a rock to feel the warmth of the sun. We chatted about our future lives. We read lying on the rough surface of the rock. Shortly after, we took off for a walk toward Northwest. A cliffhanger scenery appeared in front of our eyes while walking toward nowhere. Mighty green cypresses had grown all around the area. Some branches were bending over the thin strip of sand. We walked till our feet got stuck in stinky, stinky, black greenish seaweed. Yuck. As we tried to detangle ourselves from this devilish sea residual, A decided she wanted to proceed. We waited and waited 
and waited till she finally came back, deluded by her experience. Apparently, there was nothing to see. We walk for what seems forever on the path created by the accumulation and stratification of the sea weeds. I wonder when the first sails formed. The landscape is, is not changing, changing around, around us. us. Are, we Are we stuck? The sea weeds keep multiplying and have formed an island of the size of a giant football. I hear some sea weeds chuckle in the distance. The ones which are tying our legs and toes together were pulling us forward toward the core of the island, toward a crab hole. Why did you leave us behind? The flora and the fauna came me. I screamed for help. No, help. no one, no one can hear me. Hear me. Fifteen August, 2020, day eight, Paralia Glossa, Peloponnese, Greece. 12 p.m., breakfast turned into a light lunch, but E was constantly famished. We reached the famous Voidokilia speech on probably the most crowded day of the year. I'm sure I saw more flesh than sand, a lot of flesh. It reminded me of when I was a little child and spent one summer on the Adriatic coast, close to Trieste. Half of the population of Italy, along with their beach umbrella, was there too. We walked towards the small strip of water and started climbing up on the tree on the hill to then descend on the other side and found, to our amusement, a precious little pebbly bay. A chatty guy lives there throughout the year. We spotted him and directed ourselves toward the shade of rock where we laid our beach towels. The water was crispy cold. We dived in and swam out towards the Union, a small flashback of the Cape of Good Hope in miniature. Swimming back to the shore, my attention was drawn to the semicircles created by the hand of man on the beach and in the bay. We bathed in them for a while. The sculpture repeated itself on the stretch of the tiny beach, all around pebbles, with people's names engraved on them. How many people have inhabited this place? I do not remember exactly how, but we made the acquaintance of a smiley mid-50s couple. After a small introduction, 
the friendliest of the two shared some tips, which included a visit to the castle of Methoni. The rest of the afternoon was spent napping, listening to the neighbor's music beats, and making the acquaintance of a fluffy friend aboard a collie. The poor soul was on the constant search for water and shade. The day passed along as we read our books, played with the dog, and searched for his owner, who was never to be found. I walked toward the resident of the bay. He started the conversation as if we had been friends forever. I don't remember much of it, but two things did stick. His story of the Mycenaean tomb and of a skeleton's ox found inside it and his annoying etymological explanation of the word glossa, tongue. Almost immediately, after entering the thick woods, darkness follows. No sign of light, just pitch black, claustrophobic darkness. The absence of light feels akin to being stuck in the middle of the deepest depths of the ocean. It closes in and drowns you. We attempt to lighting fires, lanterns, use flashlights, and even try flares, but nothing can cut through the dark. Confused on what to do, we huddle together and watch the woods in pure terror. Its creeping towards us grows louder from the clacking of the adorned skulls atop its antlers, as well as the bare ribs cage of fire. It curls its long fingers, void of flesh and muscle, and in replacement, wears moss and ash. It sucks by the water, and the flaming sockets in the shared skull bores into me. Everything freezes, the world stops. The only movement between it and I are the flames licking away at the scorched ribs. Fifteen August two thousand and twenty. Day nine, Methoni, Peloponnese, Greece. I think I ate the most exquisite zucchinis flowers of my life today. We found a great tavern on the shores of Tsapi, a village next to Methoni. Filled with rice, lemon, and cheese, they melted at each bite. With a residual of the zucchini filling on my taste buds, we headed toward the ancient castle of Methoni. The queue was fast, and we soon approached the ticket counter. Once in, we walked up toward the castle, trying to avoid the people and their selfie sticks. I spotted a familiar symbol, the Venetian line of the Serenissima, 
Methoni was an important staging point in, on the trade route from west to east. We divided and I followed A. We reached the octagonal tower after a few bends. Inside, green slimy sea moss covered the walls up to midway. We walked inside and read the writings on the wall. I tried to script down my name under the one of Spears's for you to read. Over the years, the presence of water has left its traces. I hoped my presence there lived long enough for you to see it. We walked round and round. We then exited and re-emerged in the late afternoon sunlight. We gazed over to the sea as if we missed it already. We walked up the heavy stone stairs and found ourselves hanging from the pillars and took some pics. We walked back and opted for a rougher route after we passed what remained of Morosini's columns. I think I counted two or three of them. Is it possible? An inscription on the side described the findings of four sarcophagi north of the island of Sapienza and at a close distance from the shipwreck of the columns. Pity there is no time to visit. Our legs turned red from the scratches caused by the plants surrounding us. There was a reason why nobody took that path. There was nothing interesting to see except from the sea. There are intruders. I repeat, there are intruders on board. I'm walking through seamless and jelly octopi, which inhabit the ground floor of our underwater spaceship. The ground shifts and becomes water, waves slashing against my face, like those ones you experience in deep water. But I'm breathing. Never breathe better. I can feel the salt filling my lungs, a tingly sensation pervades my body, down to my feet and back to my head. In front of me, various tunnels are leading to different worlds. In them, green and purple living beings and carbon-composed elements inhabit the space. Everything sparkles and my eye becomes sharper, feeling more present in the moment. I want to walk through the portal and explore what lies ahead, but my legs freeze. Or do I have any legs? There is no time to waste. The enemy was close and we had to prepare for battle. Rapidly, I summon the fleet. Spock was our first captain, but she has grown old and her ears are now bending down. I inform her and the rest of the crew of the imminent giant octopi attack. To my dismay, they are not at all shocked as we have a much bigger problem to handle. Our rebel squad has formed on the spaceship and are hitting us from inside. We are not safe. Why are they attacking us? What does Spock do? Was she to be trusted? I bury these thoughts and try and keep my sleepy eyes open on the watch out.
Hello. Okay. Uh, thank you for this so sort of journey through lots of different elements. First of all, I'm very happy to be responding to it's a it's an actual very interesting I don't know like a ritual also for ourselves as in being the graduates an opportunity to sort of give back not only what we think or what came to our minds about the work but also it's like a gen a sort of a generosity that comes and continues going so I'm very Glad to be responding. Um, I will start by the question, how do we leave traces on the water? Um, I think it was interesting because after, after this question, something already came to my mind and then the, the whole performance was going on and I was very impressed by the multi media uh, aesthetics that you guys used and specifically very in interested about the lag of the video to what you were actually doing I, that, that really that was very interesting and then if you ask about how we leave traces uh, on the water memory came to my mind and water is one of the spaces that carry the that does take this memory or that carries memory and uh, it was very interesting to that there was this beat at the end because what came to my mind actually was a this reference of uh, this uh, electronic collective called Drexia and the whole underwater memories of these pregnant women that were capturated from the African continent and taken to the Americas and the pregnant ones that would have died in the water and so um, Drexia would be then this country of these babies that breathe on the water and it's then this like, I think it's a very uh, powerful and important thing to have in mind when we're talking about water and when we're talking about traces of the water that uh, there's a lot beyond this uh, summer pleasurable um, moment of us from this privileged positions we are and um, so yeah so I think and also one um, so yeah, that was more like a, a reference that came to my mind. And then the female voice, of course, that is narrating, and of course the the female presence in the in the in the work already, like also like so. What the question made me think of this, and then all sort of other elements were coming in, and I was weaving them somehow, and. There was some artificiality, like the artificial, like this fake sun manicure thing that was happening. And um, so these are two elements that <laughs> came to my mind and I wanted to share. And also, I was quite obsessed by this like 50s, I don't know, very nice object. And then it was like, as you were picturing this image of a beach and, and these elements of the beach, and then I was like, oh, is that the public toilet of the beach that this person is? And then I noticed it was here. And then it was like, it gave me this sci-fi moment because this is a sci-fi moment that we're living. And with all the elements of the work, I was like, whoa, that's freaky. <laughs> yeah, I think that's. Thank you uh, for this experience and uh, um, 
if I need to, um, to uh, I will start with the synthesis and then unfolding. But uh, actually, what I witnessed uh, was a creation of a symbol. And um, uh, this creation uh, had this different stages and from the space. So at the beginning, because we are so displaced and our attention here is so displaced, uh, this was resonating with the manner in which uh, actually slowly I started to collect my attention. Maybe by observing where you are positioned and then the screen, but as well all those elements, they are already present in my experience. This is why this first moment for me was uh, actually realizing that displacement and the fact that the work at the beginning didn't have the space. Uh, after when there was this, uh, I would say, dialectical, maybe movement more than dialectic, between the what was happening here and what was happening elsewhere, I will just call it um, the beyond, because this is how, but maybe even more the mental, uh, the psychic or the inland, inland empire, uh, which brought me into the telepathic dimension, where it started with the lamp and uh, the connection through, uh, yeah, through the fluidity of uh, transmission. But then there was this narrative which was happening, enacted in the, um, in the sheet. And, uh, and the reappearance of this number And uh, the fact that actually this narration was without an event, and the event was a sort of ritual which you, you were performing, especially uh, you. So I said to myself, but what is this ritual? What is about? Uh, and then maybe, this is why I say the, the essence of a symbol, because it was as if this ritual was an acting sort of a language through which I was beginning to read all, all those elements. Uh, of course, those numbers are as well those absences of, this is how we measure li life, pe people, uh, and of course, I, uh, when I see those numbers, I can not not think of the fact that this became our way actually of uh, connecting to what is happening uh, of human lives, like this post, uh, lost and uh, uh, so this was as well there, sort of, uh, and then there was the Shandons. So, yeah, you became a symbol, symbol of of something to which uh, maybe at the moment we are f having difficulty to deal with or find meaning or how to relate to. So there was all this happening. Hello. 
thank you very much. Um, I think um, the, qu the question which I'm personally left with is this question of storytelling and why is it that we tell stories and how we tell stories and um, yeah, what it means to, to tell a story now in 2020. Um, and I, and I suppose that's also a question which I would pose to you, like, uh, why, um, why stories are important to you. Um, and I felt like maybe that was embodied within what you shared, uh, shared with us, but if this was more like a discursive thing where you could speak back, um, that's what I would maybe ask. Um, and personally, I find I'm not a very, uh, I, I'm not a very uh, um, linear kind of thinker. I think so. I find linear, like hearing a story from A to B, quite difficult. So what I was left was really like these anchors which you provided, and so the things which I will remember are like seeing you. But suddenly, I saw you walk from a window with this pair of binoculars, or the the water dripping from the shells, and then the light. And in a way, when you pose this question of traces, I think those will be, it's really those, those images of the stories in which I will, I will remember and I will piece together and make my own kind of story about what it was about. Um, and maybe because I'm also just preoccupied as a maker myself, I was, thinking how this performance looked on paper as this kind of sketch and where the kind of emotional peaks lay in it for you. Like this, also this moment on the ladder with the sound um, that also provided this really important peak. And I'm, I'm personally getting used to this kitchen format but um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like with a lot of the things that I've seen, I'm left kind of thinking what is the optimum situation for this? Like, is there gonna be a really incredible light when, you're, when the light comes on? Um, and I think, yeah, these are all things I would really encourage. What is this optimum form of storytelling um, beyond this context? And, um, um, and, there, and, and maybe that returns to this question of wh why storytelling? Um, yes, so these, these are the, the things which come to mind right now. But yeah, it's really this, I, um, just as references as well, like uh, this notion of, I, I, I spent some time in Japan and um, I went to visit Kabuki Theatre quite a lot, which was like six hours of watching a story. I had no grasp linguistically, but just through image making and the tableau, I got, I was completely obsessed. Um, and I was thinking with some of the pacing of what you showed, maybe you'd be interested in looking at Buto, or, or you're already doing so, but um, just also the use of sound in Buto is really incredible. Um, but thank you very much. Is it, is it right? Yeah. No, just the, like the, the traces, the, the traces is something that is in the question, the traces is something that is present in, the storytelling and 
from, like the idea is that these are the things from the places where you are and the images and this memory. And I was wondering how, like what are the other possibilities of leaving traces or of collecting traces without the materiality of them? Because the, the explorer character uh, does play a diff, like a, it can be a weird role on like what is to be explored. Is it like this, this whole uh, having in your mind already that you don't know, but you can access when we have, when we know what that has led this world to be. So this, because of course, like the, the, the binocular and the ring, 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 that, that was present definitely brought also that element into the thinking about the, the, the work. That, that's all. Thank you. Peter, ah, yeah. Uh, maybe one an announcement. Apparently, the kitchen format is really attracting a lot of audience. We are 39 people inside at this moment. Of course, there's a rotation of Georgia and um, Erato. But then I would kindly ask you to rethink if you have been present, apart from the tutors of COPE, but mostly also for first years to think, because they will have the possibility to see quite enough to maybe allow some space also for second and third year students to attend. So if you feel the eagerness or the desire to care for somebody else that might want to be here, uh, we really have to stick to the 30 people per um, inside the space. Thank you.
Hello? Hello?
Can we pass through this? Check, check, check. Hello, thank you for waiting. So the video is also working in the screen. Video window, okay. Let's do a quick try of the video first. <clears throat> Can you put a, down a little bit the voice? A little bit, yeah. Okay, let's try this. Can you see the video? Okay, I'm ready. Yeah, so I will do it, yeah. You want. La barra azul esta se ve? Okay. So, for our next presentation, we have three new respondents. We have our graduating student, Saskia Burghaf. We have Akimboda Akimbie from the um, uh, co-op study group last year, um, connecting with performing, the living, living the performing, connecting with cycles and next year also going to be involved in um, Savi's new co-op program. 
Um, and we have Frances Gruss from the Chusma Co-op. And the floor is for Azul de Monte. Thank you. Um, I write this time the question so I can actually <laughs> do it. Um, so the question is, can we have a conversation with accumulation? And if so, how would it be like?
disembodiment of accumulation or being blurred in the background as the fuel of a tool that runs on sunlight, speed light. Liquify my body, I want to join. Breaking the fantasy of a mimic behavior, do we accept multiplicity in all of its lendiness? The tangible technology, abstract forms being explored and the secret codes. Dreaming with a refreshing icon. Do we sing along or create new tunes or do both? Folding and unfolding time, breaking individuality. Transcending the electrical connections of our singular brains, the becoming of a new state of matter. Liquify my body, do I want to join?
everything that evolves carries all mutation with time. So like any other survival impulses that being in silence will do just as much As we don't speak the words but the words speak for us Frozen in the nostalgia of an erased past Being between the Scottify body that speaks only in signs Horizontally aligned and trapped A single boy that reads waiting for the turn to arrive This worn out words, worn out lies As we don't speak the words, but the words speak for us. If we can undo the squares, maybe we'll be able to travel through time. To pass this, flex time, part time, over time, no time. We are left to hear, to receive, to be hypnotized and transform in a shared silence. Thank you.
Hello? It's good? Like this? Yeah? Okay. Thank you, Azul. Uh, again, I'm very amazed about how you put things together and how you organize uh, language and rhythm and uh, also um, the technology that you use is a, in a sort of subversive matter. And I, I wrote down a lot, so I'm not going to completely talk by heart because it makes me very nervous, as you might know. So um, first I will sh share some associations, some snippets. A bit, uh, mm, okay, like this. Okay, some uh, snippets that I got from your from your uh, performance, and then um, maybe go deep deeper into it. Um, so I think sort of the green screen color is your signature. <laughs> um, uh, I've been working with that a lot as well. So it's sort of the idea of placing the desired behind a subject or an actor, um, which is sort of uh, placed upon you and upon your actors. And I also saw it back in the video. Um, so first you saw the handshakes of uh, apparently very important white, uh, you know, uh, government people, I don't know exactly. Um, and in the gesture of it, the handshakes, it sort of provides a security, a handshake of uh, agreement um, and in that sense sort of imaginary safety uh, on like economic development uh, process progress a sort of idea of linear time a set narrative of what is going to happen like uh, future growth future possibilities an open story but it's of course not an open story um, let's see you were talking about sort of um, this idea of viral networks, a sort of techno fantasy, I would say. I wrote down something about that, but I have to look it up. Um, yeah, so like these techno fantasies of an idea of the future uh, will only sort of like continue the reproduction of a so certain social order. Um, sort of in your performance, what I got out of it is the idea that it, uh, another kind of future, sort of uh, embracing the alienation, that is sort of uh, idea of abstracting an economical system or how much it is uh, out of our hands in a way. So you made these alienated hands a bit. And um, yeah, so like this idea of the alienation of labor, of course, um, and sort of the idea of um, reappropriating re that alienation, the hands and making it tactile and the touching, I thought it was really beautiful. Um, so the question, can we have a conversation with accumulation? And if so, how would it be? Uh, so accumulation, of course, is a sort of collecting things over a period of time uh, and growing of capital. Uh, but mostly it's the process of dispossession, so it's always exclusion and uh, yeah, it's seen as a sort of logic itself and a, a dominant narrative. Um, but in the meaning of language and in the meaning of uh, the etymology of the word accumulation, um, it also means a repetition of words or a, a gathering of similar uh, meaning of a set of words. And I think in your way of speaking and the disruptiveness of uh, language and certain ways of speaking in the mic, outside of the mic, in the animation, the technological changes in it. Um, yeah, I think you tried to sort of describe new meanings to what accumulation can mean, um, where it doesn't describe a sort of given future or known idea but a non-fixed reality that's not not placed upon us like a, what you, you mentioned at one point uh, the words speak for us that idea um, and how to disrupt that i find really interesting how you did that and i'm looking forward to see more and i'm always so impressed how you put things together i'm really proud of you so thank you
I'll keep it to that for now. But I have a lot written down, I will tell you later. Yeah, thank you. Well, hola, hi, hi, Azul. Uh, okay, so yes, uh, I think I'm really appealing for by your video in terms of how you do, do you do you use image in terms of this kind of. Vi yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm quite close to some of the images you've been using uh, in terms because I've been working recently on, you know, thinking about what can we. In my case, what can we draw? But in your case, you know, uh, what can you do with your knowledge of, you know, uh, kind of digital knowledge in terms of computer generated images and virtual reality? I think you are really into that. But I'm, um, I'm, I've been really thinking, uh, I think a lot about what, you know, what kind of bodies we do, do we we build with this technology, no? in my case, drawing, but very influenced by the technologies you are using. Uh, and that, uh, because really, uh, this idea of the, the hands, more, uh, they really remind me like how in some um, video games that use virtual reality, how do you locate inside like the universe of the video game, you always need some hands to, to pick up the, the weapons or whatever, they, they really remind me like that. But what I wanted to say is what it really for me was important was the, la the last image of this plastic face, like crying, like, you know, it's like something, this kind of uh, uh, using very, uh, the, uh, a lot of emotions in, in this kind of thing that is a totally con as a construction, virtual construction that is not a human. Uh, uh, for me, it was like really, it was really close to some kind of research I've been doing on, on Xeno forms by Xeno feminism uh, research on, on abstract sex and abstract gender, uh, all these kind of things. For me, it was kind of, there was everything there. And for also about how were you building like this kind of universe and also this kind of digital universe, you were already in, with the you know, transformation of your voice. There was something like you were in between because you were also present here, that was like the other character in the screen, but you were also here. But then suddenly there was the voices in the, uh, that were coming from there, you know? That was kind of, that really, uh, for me, it really reminds me to some kind of schizophrenic, uh, you know, feeling of suddenly not knowing in which, in which plane are you, you know? You are in the virtual plane or you are in the reality that that voices were coming from reality or from inside your head, but from all the place. So it was kind of attention there. I don't know. I was thinking about all, all these things, and I think that were very... Also, mixing with the viral thing, also, can you... Not only the viral, the, the, the power as virus, or the, but also, like, uh, how in this kind of universes, like virtual universes, also the viral thing is also there floating all the time, and it's something we have to deal with.
Hello, everybody. Um, sorry about the delay. Um, the question at the beginning and then the shaking of the hands. Um, um, I don't know how to really start off, really, because I always felt a, a question presupposes an answer, but also other questions. So I was interested in seeing how you would answer your question, so to speak. And then um, what happened was very interesting for me that you included the room, the space. So we had voices in the back, huh? which I felt um, brought in the space. So now the question is no longer here in the front, but in the space and it's going outside as well. I found this very interesting um, innovation. And um, in the first kitchen this afternoon, after lunch, um, the third speaker said something about um, narratives, the story, uh, and I'm very much into stories. Uh, so I'm all the time, um, listening, looking, I'm trying to see or hear a particular story. Uh, in your case, or in the two of you, you're the green, which you mentioned, but also um, the images, and the sounds, your voice. So all this added up. Huh? So at the same time, I'm still tr looking for an answer to the question. And I said, of course, the other questions come into being as well, like the conversation, the accumulation, and is there um, something afterwards as well, so to speak. Huh? So all these things are coming into being. Huh? At the same time, what, as I said, as I said earlier, I liked very much the way you brought in the whole space, so to speak. Huh? Something that um, goes beyond this was um, looking at um, all of us negotiating this space over the few days I've been here. And I noticed you in, in particular doing the co-op, you know, running up and down all the time. Huh? which is a form of narration, and also um, precluded your, your, um, your, your question, came before your question, so to speak. So what I'm thinking, looking at all the time, is I'm sitting over there looking at you, trying to get a kind of um, a response, answer. At the same time, your question is um, resonating in my mind all the time. So these are all the kind of things which I, th I felt you and your, um, your, the, the, the person on the instrument were really trying to get across. Huh? I had a few questions myself, as, as especially the, the length of the gloves. Were they kind of um, play on the gloves we now wear, uh, are supposed to wear during these um, pandemic times? And also I, I felt that um, you prioritized or brought into focus our this present time. In doing so, it makes us aware, of course, of what is happening now. We see another, your version, so to speak, or the, the two of your, your versions, or the four of you all together, actually. But at the same time, the present always reflects the past and looks towards the future, which is what, in part, your question was talking about as well, too. So, actually, I really liked it. It was good. And, um, yeah, I can only encourage you to continue. Huh? Thank you very much. Huh?
Yo, 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 yo. Yo, 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 yo. Yo, yo. Yo, yo, yo. We have a um, seven-minute break, sharp. 